the 22nd meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices uh, as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members will refer to tablets during the course of the meeting uh, as meeting papers are provided in digital format. Um, agenda item one uh, is to consider whether to take item four in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two um, is an oral evidence session on the local government benchmarking framework. We have three panels giving evidence uh, at this morning's session. I'd like to welcome our first panel, David Martin, who is giving evidence on behalf of Solace Scotland, and Mark McAteer, Director of Governance and Performance Management at the Improvement Service. Uh, welcome uh, and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, do you have any opening remarks that you'd like to make? Just very briefly, convener, thank you again for the opportunity to come and talk to the committee uh, about their interest in local government uh, benchmarking. An improvement project. I think that uh, when we spoke last with Ronnie Hines here about uh, 18 months or so ago, uh, the committee were particularly interested in the progress that had been made. And I think a critical test for you was whether benchmarking information was being used to promote improvement across Scottish councils and whether or not senior people like myself and uh, politicians at local government level were actively interested in it. And I hope what you see today through your three sessions convinces you of the fact that we are embedding improvement through the local government benchmarking framework and it's actually beginning to get significant traction on improving change for the better in local government. So can I ask, um, first of all then, uh, is uh, this framework fully embedded in all 32 local authorities now? It is, I think, very clearly fully embedded in, in all local authorities. Not, not only are, is every council participating actively in uh, family groups in various ways to look at improvement, uh, all 32 chief executives receive regular reports at SOLAS on progress in the framework. Uh, the Accounts Commission, as you know, are very actively interested in how we're using it and continually challenge and scrutinise progress. And I think, to my knowledge, most, if not all, councils are regularly reporting the key data to scrutiny committees or full councils on a regular basis about performance in their own authority. And I think, importantly, getting beyond narrow league tabling and trying to understand what's behind the information so that service improvements can be driven forward. Do you have anything to add, Mr. McAteer? Yeah, I would just like to echo, I think, what David said. Over the last year or so, since I think we were last in speaking to you, you know, we've continued to progress you know, some of the technical issues about improving data. All 32 councils have taken part in that. The family groups that we may go into a bit more detail around, again, all 32 councils have been fully participant in that. Over 100 officers over a, se a sequence of meetings have been part of that exercise. And there's ongoing work within the programme around, for example, how we strengthen the public accountability. And again, all 32 councils have been taking part in how we develop a common reporting tool around that that will feature in their public performance reporting towards the end of the year. So the level of engagement and sustaining of that engagement has been, I think, quite significant from local government and not just from the corporate performance colleagues that we've began the project with, but including now service colleagues who have been having the family group meetings and so forth. So, yeah, traction has really gotten hold, I think. So we have <coughs> all, all 32 councils using it, reporting, improving. Um, how are we ensuring that best practice is being exported? Um, obviously, uh, one of the, the key reasons for all of this was to to ensure that uh, best practice could be exported uh, from one authority to the others. Mm -hmm. um, is that working? There's a couple of things that are happening around about it. There's the formal elements, if you like, within the, the benchmarking work itself. So, as you know, we've set up family groups. We'd agreed those family groups uh, last year with the councils. We decided to pilot two areas with the councils. Uh, and there's a, a project board that we now have overseeing the project agreed the theme. So we looked at positive destinations for children and we looked at roads maintenance. And what we did is we pulled all 32 councils in their family groups together. They interrogated the data for their family groups. So is this data accurate? The second stage was then what supplementary information do we need to make sense of that? that data itself, and then they went into the improvement exchange, so who's doing what, and a range of things came through from that. We've captured all of that, and we'll be publishing a report on both of those groups uh, in the next couple of weeks. And we've now also got a forward programme for activities over the next two years for those groups. So that's the kind of the formal side. 
But again, I think as you'll hear over the course of this, this morning, individual councils are also doing work over and above that. So, for example, I've been doing some work with Dumfries and Galloway Council, supporting a strategic service review of roads and infrastructural services. And they use the benchmarking information around that to start to guide for them some best practice visits that they took forward themselves as part of their own internal service improvement. So those kinds of informal, if you like, activities are also happening quite widely across the council and the benchmarking information feeds into that. You talked about an improvement exchange there. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to expand on that? What is this improvement exchange? Well, again, I think the kinds of things that we'll pick up, or we've picked up through the, the family groups, and you'll, you'll see in the final report, when they were looking at, for example, positive destinations, some councils take the positive destination data and are now starting to pursue it beyond the first year after school. So when a child leaves school, or a young person leaves school, we follow them for the year, you know, they go into higher education, university, employment and so forth. Some councils have started to try and track beyond that, to try and tack, uh, tie that back into their strategy to deal with youth unemployment. Other councils weren't doing that, so there's a lot of discussion around how can you do that, how can you then use that information for broader purposes to keep these kids active going forward. So it was that kind of, you know, day-to-day -day practice exchange that was taking place. There was also some good discussion, I think, by some of the councils who give specific support to children in schools themselves for positive destinations, dedicated staff to that, and also parents who are brought into the school as part of the discussion about where does this child wish to be going forward. And again, that kind of exchange uh, was aired across the family groups, and a number of councils have said they're going to pick that up and look to replicate that type of practice within their own authority going forward. So it's that type of thing that's been happening as a consequence, and the benchmarking data is the bit that's driven them towards that conversation and that exchange. Supplementary from Stuart McMillan, first of all, please. Uh, thank you. Actually, it was on can just the previous issue regarding the councillors, if that's okay. okay thank you. Uh, just to, to seek some clarification, when you mentioned about the, uh, about the engagement with councillors, does that include, is that all councillors, including the opposition councillors within the local authorities? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you'll see that the, the overview report that was issued a few months ago was signed by, obviously, the, the president of COSLA and... Uh, and Solis, and in, in practice, um, that there's, there's interest at both the strategic level through COSLA leaders in, in how the, the, the process is going. But I think the richness of it is, as I think the committee has said before, is how do you actually drill into performance at a local level in an authority, and can you then compare and learn and improve as a result of that? So certainly in my own authority, and it is typical of, of all councils, the information would, of course, go to either a, a leadership board or a, one, one or other form of scrutiny committees. It would be taken to a cabinet if that was the form of governance in a particular local authority. And in some authorities, there's an annual um, you know, review or annual development seminar drilling into some of the information. So I've also, uh, and I know one or two other colleagues have done a similar thing, tried to use some of the information in the learning for members' development days. So I think there's a range of formal and informal opportunities. But I think if the question is, is council performance scrutinised cross-party, cross-council on a regular basis? Absolutely. That's good governance, and I think that the data is used in that way. Okay, thank you. Mark MacDonald, you had a supplementary. Uh, it was just on the looking through the um, National Benchmarking Overview report, and I seem to recall when we, um, we last discussed this, I think I was a substitute on the committee at the time, um, I, asked, I raised the point around um, what, what, what was being measured and what, what the balance was between uh, input measurement and outcome measurement, because uh, obviously inputs tell us in terms of how much is being spent, but that doesn't always tell the story in terms of what quality of service is being delivered off the back of that. And while it may look good on paper to be spending uh, a large sum of money on a, on a service, um, it may be that the quality of that service is not delivering the, the bang for the buck. So have we got the balance right between looking at the inputs and also the outcomes, but also not just looking at them, but drawing the correlation between the two to inform what councils are doing with their money? To kick off, convener, um, I think that was one of the main drivers behind the whole benchmarking agenda and journey. And I think the Accounts Commission, uh, moving from the SPIs, which were predominantly about throughput or input measures, um, to embracing the idea that this is a mix of input you know, activity and, and outcome uh, has been a real step forward. And, and I think that the, the Council Commission have, have helped us drive forward that agenda. Um, you, you'll see from the range of indicators that we look at that there, there are a mix, because both are relevant. It's still perfectly important to know cost per uh, particular activity and, and compare that. But I think you need to know what you're getting 
for your money. So the outcomes, and there's a number of examples in there on social care and education, where you, we, we can compare cost information on primary and secondary education, but also look at the attainment and achievement of young people coming through. And when you put the two together, you get a much richer and deeper understanding of what's actually going on in a particular community and in a particular range of services. Now, that, that is an evolving journey, because I think one of the things we, we're clearly learning as we go forward is that the outcome world and, and prevention is what we want to achieve. And the data and, and indicators that we collect are a reasonable but not full fit for that. So we're continuing to evolve the information uh, to allow us to, to, to go right across the range of local government functions. And a good example of that would be in the current overview report, we've now got information on economic development and the reach of local government economic development services on and the impact they have on employment and unemployment. So we're, we're trying to get both of those things. And I think that the, the, the part of the reason, I think, for um, politicians being, being very interested in this at the local government level is they're concerned about outcomes. They want to know what difference services make to communities. So we'll continue in that journey. But to, to answer your question directly, there is a, a balance between um, input, throughput and, and outcome measures. If I can even just add to that, again, a couple of things. As you know, we'd said, I think, last year, and certainly the first time we met with you, that there would be an ongoing process of continual improvement of the indicators themselves, and that's something that has taken place. So last year we used, for the first time, a net costing for waste and recycling services because it was felt that was a more accurate way of capturing uh, the interrelationship between waste management and collection and the recycling agenda that all councils are seeking to progress on. So we adopted that, and that gives you new insights, I think, to some of the better practices in recycling terms across councils. But what we also do is, for all of these indicators, we, we have a, a knowledge hub, which is a kind of private website, for want of a better term, where we've got something in the region, I think, about 350 members from across all 32 councils. We undertake the an analytical work that underpins this report, and that's shared with all 32 councils. So we do look at the relationships across the various indicators. So, for example, if we're looking at children's services, not only as, you know, your point, you know, does high costs, high spend indicate good performance? Well, we look for the relationships between that within the data itself and, again, supplement that with additional analysis around about that to try and shine a light on that. And that's shared with all 32 councils. And, again, that starts to feature as part of those discussions at family group and so on as well. So it's really starting to, kind of, I think, get a hold at that level. And it's a role for us in the councils just to continue to evolve that. I certainly remember from from my time on, on on Aberdeen City Council that there were you know you had your statutory performance indicators, you had your key performance indicators, and then also yeah. there would be ad hoc measurements that would be requested by by councillors. And um, to to what extent do you see do you analyse or or do you get feedback from councils around the things that their members are looking for them to measure? Um, also, what assessment do you make of the uh, the value? attached to some of the things that are being measured uh, and what recommendations do you offer on that uh, and um, finally also how do we ensure that what's being put in front of councillors we're, we're talking we talk a lot about the cohorts in terms of the benchmarking um, and often the reports that come before councillors are purely looking at their own council uh, for, for valid reason given that you know they are accountable for what their council is doing but how often are councillors themselves being given reports that will show this is how we are performing and these are the performance measures for our council and here are the performance measures for the for our cohort um, and, and how we compare on the benchmarking. How, how often is that information being put in front of councillors, not just solely the information relevant to their council? Okay, I'm going to try and answer the last question first, if I may, convener. The annual public performance reporting ensures that um, benchmarking has been done as part of that public performance report. So it's not just elected members that are getting that, it's the whole of the community who can access information in comparative purposes. And indeed, um, the Accounts Commission Audit Scotland recently produced some information to all local authorities on uh, assessing our ability and, and, and competence in public performance reporting, if you like, and, and that was a major indicator of uh, that was being measured. It was to what extent is benchmarking you know, out there in the public. Um, I, I think that elected members clearly want to know what's going on in their own communities, but my own council in Renfrewshire is part of a city region with eight other authorities, and my leader and, and my members are just as interested in knowing what's going on in East Renfrewshire and the city of Glasgow as they are in Renfrewshire, because clearly members are driven to try and ensure that uh, your local services are performing well. And, and my own view is that the, the benchmarking project and the approach we've taken has raised the bar for us all. We're now much more aware of uh, what's going on elsewhere and indeed much more interested in trying to frankly pinch good ideas 
um, if, if they can be transferred into a particular local authority context. And I think you, you, you're seeing that evolving, as uh, Mar mentioned, the best practice approach on uh, school leaver destinations and on roads. There's another tranche of activity now underway on, for example, sports. How do we improve the participation of young girls in sports? Um, on waste management, how do we use um, education and awareness to improve recycling rates and looked after children? Uh, stability of placements has been a concern for some time in local government. How do we spread best practice in there? Now, that's come from the confidence that's been built on the first round of benchmarking activity. So I think hopefully you can see we're beginning to get a lot more traction on this and use it for improvement. Again, I, mean, I can't speak in detail about you know, what happens in all 32 councils, and I think you'll hear some of that practice later on today as well from some of the authorities you've got in. But what we've been more involved in is kind of some general support. So, for example, uh, just before summer, we ran two masterclasses uh, for elected members cross council. I think we had over 50 members attended it. So different councils, again, opposition uh, and administration members within that. To talk through with them, you know, what does this information provide you as elected members? How might you engage and use that internally within councils? Following on from that, I was also then invited to both Murray and Perth and Kinross Council to go and talk to their members exclusively about how they could equally use that information within the council. And we're frequently now getting those types of requests coming in. So we'll get again a couple scheduled for the autumn with a couple of other authorities to go in and have that internal conversation with the full council to say this information is now there. Here's what we think it adds value for you as an elected member, and then have that discussion with them. So we are more at that end of the kind of the general support, but I say I think you'll hear over the course of this morning how some councils are using it in a bit more detail uh, from them directly. Okay. Yeah, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr. McAteer, Mr. Martin. The one of the issues about <coughs> excuse me about benchmarking is the data that's collected, uh, and who collects the data and whether or not the data that is being inputted into the system is accurate, up-to-date and relevant. Uh, how assured are you that the data that is being collected is comparable across the local authorities, particularly the families, the structures that have been established, uh, and is the same data being collected so that we can get an accurate comparison uh, across the families about what's being delivered and how it's being delivered? Mr. McAteer, do you want to go first? Yeah. I think we're as confident as we can be that the data is accurate and comparable across all 32 councils. And again, I think we've spoken to you in the past about some of the, the mechanisms in play uh, to do that. So we've had ongoing work with directors of finance and Scottish Government College around about the finance data, for example, to ensure its comparability and better standardisation within the local financial return. And I think we're pretty confident that that information is accurate. What we then do at family group is just draw from that general source. So we don't get additional information, if you like, at the family group. It's from the, if you like, the core information that we have. Across the family groups, what we did see, say, over the course of the last few months was when they wanted some additional information to interrogate that data, again, we ensured, because my team play a role within the family groups, we ensured that that was consistent across all four groups that we're looking at. Uh, looked after children and roads, and that was agreed with the participants at each of the four family groups that were looking at each of those two themes. So we were there to make sure that if one group thought it would be good to look at X, that other groups were also looking at X simultaneously. So we were there to, to support that process. But again, I think, as we've said in the past, it's an ongoing process in terms of the data itself, keeping it relevant, keeping it up to date. That does remain a challenge. Uh, for example, this year we've agreed that in order to sync better with the local public performance reporting cycle in councils, we're going to publish the report early. So the last two reports have been published in February, March of each year. This year we're going to publish the report in November. We've had work ongoing with directors of finance to ensure that we get the financial data to help populate the indicators, but there are going to be other areas where we're going to be behind on that. That's because we're not the data owners. Where the councils are the data owners, we're getting good access. And that's just an ongoing challenge. It's just part of having to draw from such a wide range of data sources to, to promote the project that you end up in those scenarios. So it's never perfect, but I do think it's as comparable and as strong as we can get it at this point in time. I think that the question is very pertinent because you have to have assurance the data is accurate. And, and certainly the Accounts Commission have worked hard on that. And of course, we have external auditing of all of the, the data and information. I think there's also a maturity point. We, we did spend the first year particularly of the local government um, benchmarking approach, as members will recall, 
um, really cleaning up the data and making sure that if there were if there, if there were difficulties with it, they were at the margins. They didn't stop you drawing conclusions and drilling into improvement. And of course, it is about improvement that um, I think the local government benchmarking uh, framework is, is essentially about. And I think the, I made the point about maturity. The conversations that take place in family groups, that take place in my council, and I know others, um, it is about what can we do to improve services. We're not hung up on. Um, the comparability of the data. It's, it's reasonable for members, absolutely clear, to assume the information is accurate and correct. And that um, I, I certainly have seen the debate move on much more to how are they doing it in local authority? Why then, when we've opened this particular issue and our council's performance is, is not where we would want it to be, who can we talk to to try and actually address some of those challenges? As opposed to, well, it's different here because you can't compare apples and, 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 and pears. So I think, I think the committee can take comfort that the data, as Mark says, is good enough and we will continue to improve the, the quality of it as we move forward. Interesting response in relation to the apples and pears uh, comment. In relation to the benchmarking, and we, we have a range now, you've mentioned looked after children and roads, uh, the two areas <coughs> which have been examined in detail. But what we're being asked to do is look at a benchmarking process across a wide range of services. And it's whether or not that apples and pears comparison can be made between local authorities in the same family. Or are we going to, out with the financial accounting process, are we going to get council officials saying to elected members or saying to the public, Ah, well, it's different in Glasgow than it is from Edinburgh because we, while we spend X amount of money on that service, uh, we do it in a different way and we do it in a way that is you know, yeah. an accounting process that is slightly different, but we do it better. And it's how do elected members then hone into that and understand what is being delivered, how it's being delivered and why it's being delivered by a particular local authority if they are being asked to compare it with other family members or family group members? I think, Karina, through you, it's, it's the other way around. I think that the, the data is comparable and we've taken steps to try and ensure that it's comparable. So members rightly might ask why performance differs. And the answer to that can't be, shouldn't be, um, that the information is not comparable and we're not comparing like with like. The answer might be we've got different social economic circumstances. The council's pursuing a different priority or a different level of policy in our area and that's why the information draws those conclusions. And I think it's, it actually improves transparency if, if that's the case because I think elected members are then able to decide whether or not their relative priorities ought to change or whether or not there is genuinely a lack of resource in a particular area or actually there are some inefficiencies or a variation of any of those things. And I think that what we can't do with the, the local government benchmarking framework information is suggest that somehow it's different here because if you, you know, our, our approach to this in terms of collecting the information uh, justifies that. It, it, it isn't about standardisation. It's about being clear and transparent about why levels of service might be different and priorities might be different in, in, in local authority areas. And I think allowing elected members and the public, for that matter, to take a view on that. So I think we're past the stage in the benchmarking project where the data is the problem. I think it's now a question of well, what are the relative policy priorities and you know, how can we learn from, as, as, as the convener said in his introductory remarks, uh, good practice and best practice across Scotland. It makes it much harder to hide. No, I was just echo, I think, what David was saying there. I think in the first year or so of the project, we did spend a lot of time, I think, as David said, trying to make sure the data was clean, tidy, comparable. Over the last year or so, there's been virtually no discussion of that. It has been around other supplementary pieces of information we can use now that we've opened the can with standardised data to start to understand performance. And again, that, as David said, gets towards issues of policy choice and priority for councils differences in terms of their social economic makeup and then into the performance agenda itself so you know it, it hasn't featured much as a discussion over the last period of time I think we're relatively confident and councils are relatively confident the data is as good as we need it to be for the purposes that we identified which are always about improvement John the <coughs> issue, next issue when he raises the issue about elected members and elected members understanding of this whole process and why this has been done I uh, 17 months ago to the day, uh, Ronnie Hines, I asked Ronnie Hines about the situation with 
elected members, and I mean all elected members, understanding this. Now, what we've had this morning is there's been discussions with either executive uh, committees, the cabinets or senior councillors within local authorities. Mr McAteer, you referred to uh, a, f a master class with 50 members. Uh, we've got 1,223 elected members in Scotland. Not all of those members are members of a group uh, or a party. Some of these members, in fact, in significant numbers of members in some of the more rural authorities are in, made up of independent councillors. How do we ensure that all elected members understand this process? Because if we can't get all 120, 223 elected members to understand this process, how do we expect the public to understand it? Mr McAteer first, please. Yep. Uh, when we publish, for example, the, the overview report, uh, a link is sent to all 1,300 councillors in Scotland to alert them to it and also to try and draw them into the website itself. We also have a range of other communications with elected members as an organisation. So again, elements coming out of the benchmarking work when it's relevant will be, in effect, broadcast to all councillors as well electronically. In addition to that, we've also got a, a continuous professional development programme that we support councils. And I think there's some 20, 23 councils using the CPD framework. Uh, can I stop you there? Uh -huh. talked about CPD last week with the Accounts Commission. Yeah. Um, and they clearly indicated um, that in many cases there was no uh, continual professional development going on. I can get <laughs> the details of where that takes place through the programme that we support councils in. And again, within that, information is made available for benchmarking purposes. I think the purposes. point is, and uh, it was made quite clearly, I think, by the Accounts Commission last week, mm -hmm. um, that a number of elected members, by the sounds of it, a fairly substantial number of elected members, are not taking part in any CPD programmes. So That may well be true, but again, I think what we've tried to do as an organisation working with the councils is you make it available. You can't force politicians to take training, but we certainly make it available. We certainly encourage members to do so. We work with the member services, colleagues and councils who support elected members, again, to try and build that culture of engagement and development and training with them. So opportunities are made through that, including, I say, elements from the benchmarking work. But as I say, specifically on this, I say we alert all councillors electronically that these things exist. And we make a, a request to them. If anyone needs some support or information for ourselves, we will happily furnish that to the members as well. So we, we keep trying. I can't guarantee you that you get success in all 1,300 cases. Mr Martin? I think, again, Mr Wilson's question is about reach and, and trying to ensure that across all 1223 councillors there's an active interest in, in, in this. Um, in, in addition to the points that, that, that Mark's made, my experience is that members are, are never reluctant to scrutinise if the information is provided to them in a format that they can get a hold of, drill into. And, and that's certainly been my experience as a result of the uh, local government benchmarking framework. I mean, we have seven about 70 or 80 percent of local government spend is broadly covered by, as you'll see from the overview report, um, the, the, the range of indicators that we're, we're covering. Um, we've, we've broken them down into children's services, social work, environmental, culture and so on, as you know. Now, whether there's a committee structure or there's a cabinet structure in, 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 in the local authority concerned, portfolio holders, um, scrutiny, um, opposition members who are involved in scrutiny, committee chairs and their, their shadows or opposite numbers are getting information on their service area. And increasingly, the data is being reported in that way in local authorities, not just in an annual or on a periodic council-wide basis. Um, and I think that the other aspect of it, of course, is that the press and the media are very interested in this information, understandably, and therefore that gets members interested in, in, in the information. So I think there's a range of things happening um, that mean that all councillors are actively interested in what the information is telling them about their particular community and the services that they're either running uh, through an administration or are, are, are working on opposition basis to scrutinise. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that that's going to continue. That's in addition to, of course, the council-wide um, you know, scrutiny committee uh, and audit committee uh, activity that, that, that goes on. And I think although we can always improve that, my, my sense is that all elected members are both aware of the, um, the, 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 the benchmarking data and pretty actively interested in what it tells them about their constituency or their particular ward. And I expect to see that to continue to grow. John? I thank the members for their responses. And could I, like the convener, draw your attention to the uh, official report of last week's meeting, in which we did raise uh, concerns about the level of com 
continuous professional development and the level of information being provided to individual councillors, uh, either through training or through the processes in terms of dissemination of information, uh, just so that we, we are clear as a committee that elected members can and do understand what's being presented. And, and most importantly, they can then take that and convince the public that they know what's happening within their local authorities. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Good morning, panel. Um, I wasn't part of this uh, committee in March 2013, and I've read here in this report in 2013, I wanted to ask you about this benchmarking families. I mean, you mentioned, Mr. Martin, about uh, East Wren and Glasgow. How did you, what do you exactly mean by benchmarking families? I understand the term, yeah. but I'm not sure how you, you know, how you sort of uh, developed it. I'll start with that if I may convene and, and um, yeah, Mr McAteer could, could supplement that if, if, if you're happy to do that. The, the idea of um, very disparate local authorities was a challenge at the start of the project that, that, that Clipmanshire, Highland, the city of Glasgow and Renfrewshire are, are all different. And I think that um, what we've tried to do is to encourage each local authority to compare itself, first of all, with whoever it wishes, because you, you know, good practice isn't necessarily a function of scale or of rurality or of urban uh, you know, councils. So, so it isn't just the benchmarking families that, that the benchmarking work goes on. Um, I mean, as I said, I think to the committee before, if I see good practice and um, looked after and accommodated children, for example, in Murray, I'm going to talk to Murray Council about that. And I think, I think you, you need to be reassured that happens as a matter of routine. But the idea of the benchmarking families was that you can have common cause or a similar set of circumstances and that therefore comparison within those um, benchmarking families was a good thing to do in addition to the, the, the generality of, of, of engagement across local government. Um, and the, the thinking, we, we had some significant debate about that in, in, in COSLA and in SOLAS at the time and the benchmarking families we now have um, reflect that degree of common interest. And Mark could say a little more as we're getting more sophisticated about that. It's, it's an option to work within a group of local authorities where you're going to learn more by comparing the performance, for example, of roads or educational attainment because the councils who are in that family are experiencing similar challenges. Just a couple of things to that. We did a piece of analysis just over a year, 18 months ago, with the councils to look at if we were going to group councils, on what basis would you group them? And what the analysis showed that when we looked at, if you like, people-focused services, such as education services, the key factors that were of importance in understanding performance related to social economics and deprivation. So we grouped councils that were close in social economic and deprivation terms together to have those discussions around people-based services. For more physical services, such as roads, population dispersal came through as one of the key factors in what seemed to be explaining the differences. So we used that as a basis then for grouping those families. But there are also other family group arrangements, if you like, across councils as well. So, again, education had good practice already established in terms of sharing information across councils, and we, again, support some of that work itself. So I think, as David said, they're there is, if you like, the minimum, but there are additional factors around about that, and there's nothing to preclude councils going out with the family groups to exchange information and practice with other councils. In fact, we furnish that information across all 32 as well. Thank you, so they choose you. You choose the families, or they, each council chooses. We agreed family. collectively with the, the 32 authorities what the family groups would be, and they work at that basis. But they also exchange over and above that as well. So the families aren't the same necessary for education and street cleaning no. as they are for everything else. They can choose what they what they want. We've, we've used the say the analysis we did to guide us on mm -hmm. that, and it was David's point to try and get councils that were broadly facing similar challenges together, because we thought there'd be some relevance in the exchange mm -hmm. around that. But as I say, they do exchange out with those groups simultaneously. And has that worked? Has it, has it been successful, in the your opinion? two pilots that we've run say, earlier this year, one that looked at positive destinations for children and the one that looked at roads, we did a, an internal evaluation with the councils on that at the end of that exercise. We have tweaked it and we've now launched a programme for the next two years using those same family groups. So they have worked, but this time round, the councils themselves are going to direct the family groups rather than my team. So we'll kind of stand back from the role that we played and we'll leave it to the councils to run. We'll help them gather the information, etc. as part of all that, but they're now taking the lead in that process, not ourselves. Thank you, Camina. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alec Rowley, please. Okay, morning. Could I maybe how focus in terms of how, how, how we use this information? I mean, I find the information here fascinating, and I think in terms of council leaderships looking at budgets, etc., it will be helpful. 
But if we if you're saying that that we really want to get into this information being more useful to councillors, then how it's presented and how we use it, and maybe just pull out a few to look at that. If looked after children was talked about. And if you do see a comparison with likes of Fife and South Lanarkshire, um, Fife spending a fair bit more. But what what is it what what does that actually tell us? Because you know, Fife for that Fife could be um, looked after children in Fife could be um, succeeding much more in terms of attainment and education. It could be I don't know. What does that tell us? Um, and, and how much detail do you go into? And are we saying that all these these fifteen hundred councillors or whatever are having to try and drill down? You mentioned the website, but I've been told that it's it's a bit complex to actually get in there and understand it. And I sometimes think that if we're going to have these councillors trained in all these different things, then 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 they'll all need PhDs and we'll be able to sack all the highly paid officials and, and the councillors can start running the councils because they'll be so qualified to do so. Mm -hmm. So so what is it that we actually do? The looked after children. Also can you pick up on like home care services? Um, and if we look again, Fife um, looks certainly more expensive than your own authority, David de Renfrewshire. Um, but what does that tell us? Because I know that in Fife they've got a much higher proportion of services delivered in house than they have through through the, um, the use of the private sector. And some would argue in Fife that as a result of that they actually have a better quality service being delivered. I don't know. Um, so what does this tell us and how are you presenting it and what information lies below that and how are we getting into the detail of that? I think so, so you can I think um, Mr. Earley has just demonstrated the value of the data because what, what, you've, what you're basically saying is you've gone beyond the headline and you're then trying to understand the reasons for that. And that is exactly what happens. The data allows you to start a conversation. It's not of itself a solution or you can draw simplistic conclusions. And if you take both the examples that you've, you've given, um, that, that South Lanarkshire example um, and my own authority, for example, uh, we, we've had conversations within the, the, the Greater Glasgow area about the, the, the relative differences on looked after children, and it boils down to all the factors you mentioned and more, the extent to which looked after children are accommodated at home or looked after at home, the extent of use of residential care, um, all of the issues associated with how education and attainment plugs into that. What it allows you to do is to get behind the headlines. You might well conclude, as you just have on, on home care, that actually there's a policy choice you want to make on the basis of differential costs because members believe that the quality or the approach is in fact better in Fife and suits your local circumstances than, for an argument's sake, in, in my own council in Renfrewshire. So I think what the data does is it starts allowing members to scrutinise policy, policy options and policy choices. The, the issue about, looked at, uh, about uh, care at home, for example, may depend on procurement practices. I know, forgive me, uh, just, just give an example, convenient if I may, but um, when we recently re-tendered for care at home services in, in Renfrewshire. Um, we, we did look at the benchmarking data. We did have a sense about where we were in the, the, the Clyde Valley, if you like, in terms of uh, pr pr procurement and comparative costs. My politicians were very keen to ensure that when we, we went out and tendered uh, for services that we built in the living wage. We did something about zero hours contracts. We were keen to make sure that there was quality of training and learning for employees. That conversation started because of discussions about what was going on in other authorities flagged up by the benchmarking information. So in a very real way, you can see how the, the benchmarking approach allows conversations to be to take place about what's going on elsewhere that then leads to political dialogue and you know, member-led approaches to how you might take forward different services. So I think, to, to again, to, to, to give that example, Convener, but... The, the, no, I think the, it's good to give the example, Mr the, Martin. The, 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 fact, the fact of it is that the benchmarking data just makes it more transparent and allows us to then have those kind of comparative approaches and, and, and conversations with, with elected members about where they want to go with their policy priorities. If I can... If the improvement service pick up on that, but let's say a member of the public getting this report, and it is fascinating, I, I welcome this, it's a step in the right, the right direction, absolutely, but a member of the public getting this and going to a councillor in Fife and saying, well, you know, it costs quite a bit more for looked after children in Fife than it does South Lanark. And the councillor in Fife says to them, well, that's because we're actually delivering a better service at the end of the day. How does a member of the public check out whether that's right or wrong? Can they go into the improvement service website? Will that tell them anything? How do they actually drill down or is it not for them to drill down? Mr. Back to you. 
anyone can access the website, so that there's not a problem with that. There is a tool on it that you say you, you don't quite need a PhD to run it, but you know it, it's pretty sophisticated and it allows you to bring different data together. Again, I think that's something important. It to involves here. a lot of hovering, I believe. <laughs> There's a bit of hovering you can do if you wish. There's also another tool in development that we'll maybe get you a link to in a couple of weeks. We've been developing with the Welsh Local Government Data Unit that we'll publish or launch uh, in tandem with the PPRs later in the year. But the point I was going to make is that within this, what we've constantly stressed is don't simply look at one indicator in isolation of something else. High or low cost in and of itself isn't the explanation. So, it's, again, I think as David said, the point you've made, it's... It allows you to start to raise questions. And when you take the performance data and the cost data together, you ask questions and you ask, well, why is it different? And I think the whole point of the process for benchmarking is to get answers to that why. Sometimes it's because we choose to be different as a council. And if it's about a service weakness, then what are other councils doing that my council can learn from so that I can plug that weakness? That's the way the conversations, I think, are going within the councils. But this was deliberately constructed to do exactly what you just done with it ask questions and we'll continue to simplify and make it easier for people to do that and I think again the other part to remember is that this is a national report all 32 councils then report locally on their performance and later this year when we launch a, kind of, a revised version of the local end of this the local reports will also include the improvements that are happening in each of the authorities off the back of the work that we've done through the benchmarking so we're just there as the national bit it's the local bit that gives you the real detail about what's happening in Fife and again I think we'll continue to see that improve uh, for the next set of reports. Alec. Okay. And just I mean, two other quick points and in terms of best, best practice because if you take for example the library service um, and you look at some place like Argyll and Butte and uh, its cost jump out has been high and you think well okay well that's, that's, that's rural until you go along and you look at Highland and, and their, their costs are, 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 are significantly lower. Um, and I suppose it's how do you, do, do you then link into best practice? Because in some of, these, some of these authorities with some of these costs, they would be cheaper um, just telling the, 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 the resident to, to go into Amazon and get the book delivered than they could keep it and the council will pay for it than they would be to, to hire the book out. And is there, is, is, but is there good practice? Because... How has Highland got that down? And I wonder, do you follow up on the good practice? And one other question, because it jumps out at you, really jumps out at you, is the direct payment spend and, and the fact that Glasgow have um, completely shot up in terms of the, 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 the use of direct payment. And again, the interesting thing for me there would be, how is that operating in Glasgow? They've clearly went to promote it. Is it working well? Um, and and, and is, it, is it a better service? And, and therefore, why is other authorities so far behind? Your last point, Glasgow have been part of a national pilot to look at direct payments. That's why you've seen the spike in their performance. So there's been particular work done in Glasgow to, as part of that national project to encourage direct payments. So there is a process, I think, through that group that are now looking at how do we take the learning from what Glasgow and a couple of the other councils have done in the last year in order to improve uh, <coughs> that particular service. Your point about libraries is a useful one. And again, I think at this stage, all we've done is use this data to raise those questions. Family groups haven't looked in detail yet at libraries. That's scheduled in for, I think, next summer. Uh, the family groups are going to start to look at the library services. But I suspect, and you may hear more of that later today, that some of the individual councils, when they see the data, they're already asking those types of questions and then making contact with authorities elsewhere to try and answer some of the questions for themselves. So I don't think they'll sit back and wait for us through the family group process, getting around in a year's time to look at libraries. They're already doing that themselves, is my understanding at the moment. Where it is, I don't know, because we're not involved in those conversations. That's between the councils themselves. Mr. Martin? It's, just really it's sort of very refreshing, I think, to, to reassure um, you know, uh, Mr. Rowley that those are exactly the same questions that I'm getting asked by culture, sports and arts conveners and opposition members to take Mr. Wilson's point about what can we learn, what's this telling us? And, and that's what I meant by transparency and, if you like, an inquiring mind. Um, the... the um, kinds of questions and, and analysis and scrutiny that I think members are well capable and, indeed, day, day and daily do give of officers, um, I think will lead us to better services. And to take Mark's point earlier, sometimes the answer is actually there's an inefficiency here we need to iron out, which in the current public sector finance climate we need to be doing very proactively. Sometimes it's a question of policy choice. And in the case of the Highland and Argyll issue, I don't know it terribly well, but I do know that Highland have a, a real information access and technology approach to their um, 
that the use of their libraries you see them as community information hubs, it may or may not be the case that that's the position in, um, in an Agile and Butte. And that might be an example where two rural authorities can have a conversation, and indeed are, about well, what can we learn from each other in this particular area, driven by the availability of the data. Supplementary, John Wilson, yeah, please. Can you, thank you. Just on that point that Alec Riley's raised, in terms of the baseline that local authorities were starting from, and I think the Argyll and Butte and Highland Library Service is a good one to, is a good example to use, is that not all local authorities were starting from the same baseline. And what calculations or what uh, work has been done to try and get that baseline or understand the baseline that local authorities are working from because there are, clearly have been decisions made by local authorities prior to the benchmarking exercise. I can think of Glasgow in terms of care services who uh, basically put their care service out to an arm's length organisation. Other local authorities provide those in-house. Your own example, Mr Martin, where the elected members have insisted that in terms of looked after children, uh, you have a minimum wage, you have a guaranteed working hours a week and things like that. Was there any work done in terms of where local authorities were starting from in terms of this process? Because they would have been starting from different uh, decisions being made, historic decisions being made as to where they find themselves, particularly when you're calculating the financial aspects of what they're delivering. Uh, first, Mr. Martin. Thank, thank you, Convener. It's certainly been the case that the data is comparable and then does immediately lead to those kinds of questions and those kinds of issues. And it's, it's not about suggesting that one set of policy choices or political choices in one part of, of Scotland were better than another. It merely makes it clear that that's what's happened. And I think that the, the dialogue then leads to how much of that is transferable then um, between one authority and another. And you then get into the richness of the, the, the debate, if you like, about how to try and improve public services. So I think that um, the, 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 we are comparing apples with apples, to use the earlier metaphor. And I think that the kind of um, issues that, that, that Mr Rowley raised make it very clear that members then get into the, well, are we happy with what we're doing in our particular community and compared with a, a, another one? Um, so I, the, the, I wouldn't want to give you the impression that there was a, a kind of initial problem. It was merely making sure that the data allowed those kinds of conversations to, 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 to take place. And I think they are leading to significant um, willingness to look at quite difficult and intractable problems in local government. We, we did start, as, as Mark said, with um, looked after, sorry, with, um, with school leaver destinations and with roads, but very quickly, and, and with a lot of support from councils, we, we were touching on the areas I mentioned earlier, museums, equalities issues, HR practices, um, the issue about libraries that were mentioned, and a whole variety of other you know, areas in local government, all driven by an interest in trying to make sure that we're doing as well as we can do and that we use the information that the benchmarking project has, has thrown up. I want to uh, go back to some of the initial discussions that there were um, when we first looked at this. Uh, and one of the things that was said was that local authorities uh, would, of course, uh, caveat the reasons for uh, why they were at a certain place. Uh, because some of them will have made policy choices uh, to spend some more uh, money in uh, some more money in, in certain areas, and rightly so. That's what local democracy is all about. Um, have local authorities be, been caveating the reasons why they are at a certain place by highlighting the policy decisions that they have made, and are others looking at what they have done um, uh, and looked at the outcomes rather than necessarily? Um, the indicator itself. Absolutely. I, th I think not caveated them, explained them. And I think that's the, the kind of key message, I think, from, for, for the committee. And um, in, in, in doing that explanation, perhaps sometimes revisiting the original rationale for the particular service and either reaffirming that or thinking, Do you know, maybe it's time we actually changed our approach. So I think you're beginning to see evidence of that emerging, and you'll hear some of that, I'm sure, I think later on this morning. something that would be useful for us, as well as having the national report, is to see some of the local reports that have been uh, have been out there. Anne McTaggart, sorry to keep you waiting, Anne. No, no, that's fine, um, and good morning, panel. Um, thanks, convener. Um, the comparators, we have talked about them looking at the 32 local authorities, but have we thought about outside the box and looked at um, other, U even the UK or, or even further afield from there? 
Um, yes, uh, the local government benchmarking project is important, but it's not the only thing, obviously, that the local authorities are doing. I mean, I know, for example, in um, employability and labour market programmes locally in, in, in Renfrewshire, we spent a lot of time over the past 18 months comparing our performance with that of Manchester, Leeds and a whole variety of other you know, major city regions. Um, obviously, there's a city deal being launched today, which is a major uh, labour market element on, on that as a partnership initiative. A lot of work has been done on looking at how um, city regions in England have actually dealt with the labour market agenda. So th there are lots of examples of that across local government services, I, 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 would, I would stress. We're also, and maybe Mark wants to say more about this community if, if there is time, about rolling out the approach across community planning partners, because the approach to, to benchmarking is, is rich in local government, but even richer when you start looking about a plan for place and how the health service and the other key partners in the community planning a partnership operate collectively and that gives us an opportunity to push further towards the point that Mr Macdonald made about outcomes because of course community plan partnerships are all about outcomes and single outcome agreements so we're on that journey just now and I've just started it uh, in, in, in earnest. Mr McAteer. Okay before I pick up that point about CPPs just a couple of other things on your point about working elsewhere in the UK. Uh, we've had some discussions with our colleagues in Wales and I say they've been working with us on a piece of software uh, that we'll launch later this year and in return for that support we've agreed that we'll support them uh, with some of the benchmarking work that we've done. They're going through their own reform process in Wales at the moment, a restructuring of local government. So they've asked that if later in the year we can open that dialogue in detail with them and we'll do that. And again, I've been over in Northern Ireland this year to talk to colleagues through the Local Government Association over there who again are going through a reform process and they've asked for further work to be done with us next year once the new councils are up and running in Northern Ireland as well. So we'll be there to you know, Here's our practice, here's some guidance from the kind of experience we've had, and we'll continue to offer that to other colleagues elsewhere uh, across the UK. The point about CPPs that David made, I think it was something we discussed with you uh, when we were here the last time. We've now agreed a programme with the uh, Scottish Government, and we'll launch it in the autumn, to take some of the insights about how you do benchmarking with local governments into community planning partnerships. Uh, a project board has been put together at the moment. I think it's scheduled to meet early October for the first time to oversee the programme. And what we intend to do is to publish a draft indicator framework in, again, the autumn following that first board meeting, consult with the community planning partners themselves and come to agreement about what would be a core data set to begin that dialogue and process of benchmarking across the, the CPP. So we'll launch that in the autumn and we're looking to then have, in effect, the equivalent of that overview report available probably sometime early next spring. Kind of April, March, something like that is the, the plan at the moment, but we'll see how that goes. So hopefully come the springtime we'll have something to say about the community planning process in a lot more detail. And it'll not be exactly the same, obviously, as what we're dealing with with councils, where it's services that we're dealing with. It will be much more of the outcome end of the spectrum and involve all community planning partners. Anne? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, are we back at the very onset of the committee looking at benchmarking? Um, we also had a concern about um, local authorities having to give data to all different sources, in a sense. Has that, has, has that changed any, or has it alleviated any of the stress from there? It remains, I think, a big issue about you know, data access and data management for councils. Um, again, this is not the only work looking at that. There are other groups, I think, at Scottish level, looking at some of those issues. Two groups that we're involved in certainly is the Improvement Service, one called the Improving Evidence and Data Group, which again brings colleagues from across Scottish Government and the whole public sector together to look at one, exactly those issues about making data easier to access for all public services, not just councils. And I think in addition to that, something called the Public Service Reform Board are looking at the performance management frameworks across the public sector. And again, one of the rationales is to make it easier to access data and to harmonise the type of data that we're all providing across the public sector to various different performance frameworks. It's a perennial problem. It's not perfect, but there are attempts, I think, to clean up a lot of that, not simply through the work that we've been doing, but certainly elsewhere as well. But it just remains an issue. It's, it's not perfect, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, other, uh, just moving on from... Thank you very much for all that information and, and your evidence today, but... Um, can we ask about your, your immediate or, or medium-term development of the framework from here on in? Yeah. Again, I think in the, the overview report, uh, we kind of set out some of the developments. The family groups is the biggest development, I think, over the next year. 
So we will have, I think, eight themes explored over the next year, and then the year after, a further eight themes. And again, as we said earlier, over and above, councils will do their own thing. So that's going to be the big investment over, I think, the next period of time. Getting the local public performance reports strengthened towards the end of this year is a, kind of a second major area for ourselves. And again, that's well underway as a piece of work, and we'll be working with the councils through to about November to finalise that piece of work. And the last big area, I think, for us is going to be around customer satisfaction. And I think, you know, we had highlighted previously, we use the Scottish Household Survey as the basis for customer satisfaction within the framework, <coughs> but it was never ideal. It's a good sample if you want to understand issues at Scotland level. Once you get down to the individual council level, the data samples become small and tend to be somewhat unreliable. So again, over the next 12 months, the big area is to strengthen that up from the local authority perspective so we've got stronger customer service data in future feeding into the benchmark. So they're the three big areas, but there'll be other things as well. And again, we can send you through, if you wish, a copy of the full development plan. You can see some of the other areas that we'll be working on as well. But they're the major ones. very useful yeah. for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If you're very, very brief, Mr McMillan. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, convener. Um, last week, the COSLA Commission uh, produced their report um, on local government, and uh, have you had any discussions with them, bearing in mind the, the recommendations I've actually had in the report? With COSLA or with the Commission? With the Commission. Uh, I was one of the advisors to the Commission, and certainly we made them aware of the work that we'd been doing through benchmarking as part of their discussions. And I think, given what they did then conclude around the need for stronger local accountability in terms of local democracy going forward. I think that kind of chimes with what we've been doing. I think it gives us fertile ground, depending on what happens with the, kind of, the recommendations of that report, to continue to promote this kind of work. So I think it kind of chimes well with what they're saying. But it was certainly just there as background information to them. There was no real detailed discussion uh, following uh, their various events over the, the last six months or so. OK. And finally, um, it was seen by many that... Uh, that this entire project and uh, the data would be used as a stick to beat councils with, and there seemed to be quite a fear about that at the very beginning of this process, and maybe it's why the process took so long, I don't know. Um, that doesn't seem to, to be the case. Would you maybe like to comment on that, Mr Martin? Um, I think it's about local government being confident about performance and improvement, and certainly that's been very much the message that we've had from the COSLA leadership, from individual councils, political leaderships and oppositions, that we need to know how we're performing in order to improve public services, and we have a burning platform in terms of public finances. So I, I think that, yes, it would be fair to say there was some, um, some nervousness, I guess, about to what extent we would have unhelpful and uninformed league tables in the press. Uh, certainly, we, we tried through the launch of the project to get a more informed debate, if you recall, uh, when it was launched last year, and that worked. So I, I, I think the kind of feedback that we're now getting from the media uh, is about interest in how public services are performing, as opposed to, if you like, naming and shaming and talk of postcode lotteries. That was part of, I think, the concern. Um, and I think it has built confidence, convener, in, in, in using the data. I think what we've demonstrated with this is that local government um, is good at and can be relied upon to self-evaluate and to use the information for improvement. Thank you very much for your evidence today, gentlemen. I'll suspend for a couple of minutes for a change of witnesses, please.
Uh, I now welcome our second panel of the morning, uh, Steve Grimmond, Chief Executive of Fife Council, uh, and Elma Murray, Chief Executive of uh, North Ayrshire Council. Uh, welcome to you both. Would you like to make any opening remarks? I would convene her, please. Ms Murray, please. Okay, th th thank you very much, and thank you very much to the committee for inviting me here today to give evidence. Um, just, a, as I say, a few introductory remarks. North Ayrshire has worked with the Improvement Service and Council colleagues um, across the, the, the Council community um, over the last three years on this particular area of work, um, which is why I'm very happy to, to come here today and try to answer all of your questions. Um, benchmarking... Um, as a process, as opposed to the actual benchmarks themselves, um, that benchmarking as a process is a fundamental and important part of the Council's overall approach to performance management and performance improvement overall. Um, the, the local government benchmarking framework is not the only framework we use. So an example of another area that we do a lot of work with is the Association of Public Sector e Excellence, which covers um, England, Wales and Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. Um, but it is very much about driving improvement um, and it's about, um, for staff particularly, learning more about critical thinking. Um, the process, as you have gathered from your previous questions this morning and answers, is very much still evolving. Um, I believe that that will continue. Um, it involves uh, elected members, and I can talk more about that if you like, um, chief officers um, and staff. And importantly, I raise staff because a lot of this is about the overall culture and the ethos of improvement within the totality of the organisation. Um, you mentioned local reports earlier on, and if you would like some copies of the local reports that North Ayrshire produces for its, its cabinet and scrutiny committees, I'm very happy to provide those afterwards. And that concludes my opening remarks, Chair. I think there. it would be useful to, to have those reports, Ms Murray. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, Mr Grimmond, please. I've no... Uh, opening remarks to make. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in terms of that that level of scrutiny, that level of overview uh, by, by councillors, first of all, you mentioned again Cabinet and Scrutiny Committee. How, how much access do all of the elected members in North Ayrshire have um, to uh, the, the data? Um, and how have you uh, helped them understand what it all means, uh, not only in, in general terms, but what it means for North Ayrshire uh, in, in comparison with, with its family members, for example? Thank you, Convener. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the way it works in North Ayrshire is that this year um, we have provided reports to both our Cabinet and Scrutiny committees and it's pretty much identical reports that they get. All of our elected members get copies of all of the cabinet reports as a matter of course. So they get a, a weekly delivery of, of reports and for each time we have a cabinet they will get their cabinet reports included in that. So all elected members get the information provided to them. Um, the members who actually sit on cabinet are the uh, members of the administration and scrutiny is cross-party membership. Um, including independence, of which North Ayrshire has a, has a fair number. Um, so in total, though, that would be 14 out of our 30 elected members that would actually be sitting in a meeting deliberating the reports with officers. In addition to that, or last year, um, what we did when we started to produce this um, following the very first annual report from the Improvement Service um, what, what we did was we actually took the reports to council, which meant that all council members got access to it the very first time that we considered it. And this year, as I say, we've honed it down to cabinet and scrutiny to allow us more time to debate and go into the detail in a lot more information than we're actually able to at a full meeting of the council. Um, we have been, as I said, um, evolving and developing our approach to performance management overall and performance improvement. And we have been looking at um, the, the overall approach to benchmarking, including all of our other different benchmarking forums that we get involved in. And it is our intention, so we haven't done this yet, um, but it would be our intention that once we've pulled more of that work together and 
can present it to members in a cogent way that um, allows them to see the, the overall work that we're doing, um, we would intend to take that to all members again as a, a performance a management and improvement seminar and expect that to take place later on this year. Okay, I, I'll come to you in a second, Mr Grimmond, with, with, with the, the same questions, but in terms of frontline staff, uh, one of the, the things which I think I've said previously uh, is in order to, to drive that improvement, um, frontline staff have got to be aware of where um, the council is at. Um, they're often the ones who come up with the best ideas for improving uh, services. How do you relate this information to frontline staff and what input do they have in terms of driving that improvement? Okay. Front, frontline staff, um, first of all, will, some of our frontline staff will take part in some of the benchmarking activities. So when we look at particular aspects of our um, performance and determine how we will engage with the improvement service and indeed uh, through the families or through peer groups, which could be different from our family groups as well. Um, then frontline staff would be uh, the staff who would actually get involved in doing that, that work. Um, what would happen with that work is that that would then, um, rather than cascading down, that would bubble up to senior management and to chief officers where appropriate to allow us to have a look at the recommendations that are coming from that work. And um, if, you, if you don't mind, if I could give you an example of how we've done that please this do. year. Please do. Um, a piece of work that, that we did um, over the course of this year was to look at educational attainment for looked after, and uh, looked after children. Now, that's, that's a, a family, family group piece of work that will take place through the Improvement Service this year across all authorities. Um, but we, we did an early piece of work on this this year because it was of particular importance to us. And obviously, we had the, the information from the first couple of years worth of benchmarking to um, point us in that direction. Um, so we got together with another um, four local authorities. And it was, it was our staff, our service delivery staff, who got involved in that work across all of the authorities. They looked at what issues were causing poorer performance for looked after children, where it was better, because there are some particular areas where it's, it's better. So, for example, for looked after children, where we actually take them into council or um, a, if, if you've got private accommodation, but certainly in North Ayrshire, it's council accommodation. If we take them into some of our children's units, their performance is generally much better than it would be if they are still staying at home. We also find that we get better performance if they're um, with foster carers, living with foster carers as well. So what, what we did with that then was, was look at, well, what were the conditions for better performance? So the environment that these children were living, living in and, and what support they were getting in. Um, but also, what were the similarities between what we were doing and were there any differences? Now, what we found from that piece of work was that actually there were lots of similarities for what we were doing, but there were some um, ideas that came out from the, the staff themselves about what they thought they could progress further. And it was because they were spending a concentrated piece of time looking at the conditions for these young people and working with other colleagues and other councils helped to develop other ideas. So we had about four or five recommendations that came out of that piece of work that then came up to chief officers to allow us to look at that and say, yes, we are happy that you go on and you progress with this work now to try and effect even more improvement in the work and in, in what we've been doing and the outcomes for those uh, children. I'm going to take you back a wee bit. Um, before you, you gave the example, yep. you said that some of your frontline staff yep. uh, had an N. Um, how can we ensure that all frontline staff uh, play a part in that improvement and know what this is about? Now, I, one of the reasons why I ask that is quite often uh, in my days in the council, you'd get a, a member of staff coming to you and saying, Kevin, I have never been listened to on this particular matter, but, you know, we could improve this by doing X, Y and Z. Um, and it was often the case that that X, Y and Z made a huge difference in terms of service delivery into folks' lives. So how do we ensure that all staff, not just some, 
are involved in this process? Okay, well, can, can I say first of all that I, do, I don't think that, that that particular question you're asking me necessarily relates directly to the local government benchmarking framework. I think that's about having an improvement ethos and approach across the whole of the organisation. So there are a number of other um, activities that North Ayrshire Council will adopt and um, I, I guess facilitate with their staff to allow all of our staff to get involved in improvement activity. Now I couldn't hand on heart say to you that 100% um, of the staff in North Ayrshire right now are involved in improvement activity but there is opportunity for them all to be involved in improvement activity and, so, and the reason that, or the way in which we do that are through um, issues such as um, suggestion schemes to allow staff to bring forward their own suggestions for how they can make improvement by very regular communication between staff, senior managers, um, team leaders and staff members about why, wh what's happening in their service and how they can improve it by having a range of different projects and initiatives which we clearly communicate across um, all staff members which allow them to see where improvements are being made and the fact that their peers and colleagues are getting involved in those improvements at different levels across the organisation. So it's, it's much, much broader and much more about, I guess, the organisational development activities of, of the Council that allow some of that to take place as well. I may come back to that. Mr okay. Grimmond, uh, do you want to tell us how you're ensuring that uh, councillors are able to scrutinise uh, these uh, 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 benchmarks and, and also able to improve? And I'm also interested to hear the staff involvement and uh, at what level staff are involved in terms of, of these issues. OK. In terms of <coughs> elected member engagement, um, we've embedded um, the local government benchmark framework in our council plan. So at a very high level, we've recognised um, that suite of indicators as a good proxy for performance across the Council and identified that as an improvement target for the Council over the, the lifespan of the, the Council plan. Uh, and that was considered by the full Council and agreed by the full Council and uh, monitoring on progress in relation to the Council plan returns to the full Council on a, on a regular basis. So at a very high level, we've recognised that. In terms of more... Um, forensic opportunity to, to interrogate the performance information. Um, we have also then embedded uh, the LGBF framework within our service plans and through that process um, considerations given uh, uh, biannually uh, through our scrutiny committee. So there's an opportunity to, to challenge progress in relation to services and look at that through the lens of the performance data that we've got through LGBF, including um, a, a comparative analysis on cost data as well. So that's that's in front of the, the scrutiny committee. I think the third element of that is is through our executive committee and the administration's involvement in both setting policy and in undertaking. Uh, decision making in relation to budget strategy and again we've used the uh, LGBF data and part particularly the cost comparative data as um, one fairly rich seam of information which helps um, at the very least as a can opener to allow members to begin to scrutinise spend uh, in particular areas and uh, ask questions about uh, the opportunities for efficiency uh, in some areas where the performance data would suggest that, that Fife is a an outlier in relation to both our, our family groups and, and more broadly across the board. Um, in relation to staff involvement, I think equally in, in setting this as a, as a high level priority for improvement within the council plan, uh, I've ensured that we have engaged with staff across the council, first of all to, to elevate the um, focus and importance of performance and the LGBF data being um, a significant lens through which you can look at performance. It's not the only lens, there are a number of other ways in which we do that, but um, highlight that that's important. Um, we've shared information um, uh, with all staff um, about our relative performance in relation to that data set and encourage staff to uh, engage uh, with that um, dialogue around how we can improve over time. 
and the ways in which that can then happen are, are, are various and, and probably mirror some of the, the points that, that Elma made in terms of individual staff being encouraged to bring forward suggestions for improvement, um, more planned approaches to looking at particular areas and involving staff across the, the, the hierarchy in improvement uh, programmes. Um, and uh, also we have improvement boards um, which are uh, populated by senior staff of the council but also in, in, involve staff right down the front line in um, looking at how we can make improvement. So there's a range of ways we would do that. So the, the other thing to say, just in terms of going back to elected members, in addition to the, the, the consideration that we we'll provide through committees, we also provided um, full information on the, the benchmark information for all members of the council at, at the point of publication. Okay, and McTaggart, please. Thanks, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, Ms Murray, you had mentioned earlier or, or at the very beginning of your speech about looking at, it was UK and further afield, the, was it the public sector of excellence? Could I ask you to tell us a wee bit more about that? And, and does that, do, to, to enable you to do that, does that, does that create loads of extra work and loads of different data? Ms Murray? Um, we've We've been working with the Association of Public Service Excellence for um, longer than, than we've been doing the local government benchmarking framework. Some of the indicators and data that we send to um, APSI, as it's called, uh, is, is the same and some of it's different. Um, APSI is, uh, has got its, its roots in, um, I would say, a lot of the what would have been the traditional blue-collar type operations of councils, but it has has expanded from that now as well. So some of the data is the same, some of the data is in addition to that, but it's all data that we feel is relevant to the performance in our council, and um, they are um, benchmarking groups that we are particularly interested in participating in. So some, some of the examples um, around that would be around refuse collection, building cleaning, um, highways and winter maintenance and so on. So some of them are the same and some of them are a wee bit different. Those examples that you had just given there, um, has a, have you made changes within, like taking an example from the UK that, that, that perhaps do it differently, have you made any changes within? Sometimes we make small small changes um, and, and to be honest I wouldn't have the detail here today, I could get that for you another time if you wanted that. Um, and uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's bigger changes. But what, what it does is, I think, importantly, is it makes sure, um, just picking up on one of the points that, that Mr Grimmond was making about the different lenses that we use to look at performance, it gives us another lens and it gives us another suite of performance information that we can compare ourselves against. So it's looking out with the council, with other, other areas, to get that broader perspective on what we're doing. That's me. Thanks, Convener. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Mark McDonald, please. Convener, um, how often do you as a council review the indicators that are put before members? Because obviously there are some that are statutory, but there are others which councils themselves choose to place before members. Um, how often do you review that? Mr Grimmond. Um, in terms of uh, the council management team, we would uh, review... Um, the corporate indicators on a quarterly cycle. So the, the a defined set of basket of indicators, which would include reference to the LGBF suite, but would, would have some additional indicators. Um, that's mirrored uh, through the Council Scrutiny Committees, where, again, there's six monthly uh, cycle of review of uh, service plans and performance in relation to that. Um, at individual service level, um, there will be more regular quarterly um, review of uh, specific indicators in relation to an area of service. Ms Murray? Yes, um, we, we would do that as a council, uh, as a corporate management team, we do that on a six monthly basis with some exception reporting in between times depending on what particular indicators or issues are telling us in areas where we're seeking to make a very specific piece of improvement. Um, that, again, is, is mirrored through our cabinet and uh, scrutiny committees um, on an annual basis. Though, in addition to that, to that six monthly, we also have our public performance report, which we, we take to council. So, so in, in essence, they're getting three, three opportunities at elected member level and yeah. um, at least three opportunities um, at uh, corporate management team level over the course of the year. 
of when uh, reviews take place, obviously there's also the statutory performance indicators as well. Um, and I'm aware there are some measurements that have been undertaken by councils for a, a very long period of time. Um, some of those will be relevant, some of those may become less so. Do you think there are some things that we continue to measure which we shouldn't be measuring anymore? And are there some things which we ought to be, ought to be measuring that we're not measuring at present? And, and how do you have feed into the, the process in terms of what SPIs are, are, are being measured? You, you may want to add to that because uh, there was discussion at the very beginning of this process of creating a uniformity in terms of all of the measures that, uh, that were going to be uh, done by various bodies. Um, has that uniformity uh, started? Is it complete? Uh, will it ever come to fruition? You may want to add to that um, to your answer to Mr Grimmond. Okay. Um, I think just picking up that last point, first I think the LGBF framework has been a significant tool in um, driving towards uniformity and comparability. At its, at its heart, and that's been a, a, a positive development. I think the other thing that has done in, in, in answer to Ms MacDonald's uh, question is, certainly from a five perspective, it has allowed us to review uh, the wider range of performance um, data that we currently collate. And what that's led to is, is a degree of um, culling of some of that performance data, a sense that we had a, a, a kind of myriad of, of um, very forensic data, uh, but not necessarily well aligned to what were the key priorities that we were trying to deliver as a, as a council. Um, so th th we've been going through a process of um, almost at a service level um, in reinforcing the need for um, comparable uniformity so that we've got key indicators that we can compare ourselves in relation to. And as a consequence of that, uh, challenging our services and members have been challenging as well uh, around um, whether we can reduce um, or remove some of those indicators that are less relevant. In terms of are there other areas that would additionally be useful, I suppose one of the, 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 the um, issues is uh, locally set priorities and how you measure progress in relation to those and they may be consistent. They, they, the LGBF data may well assist in shining a light on that but there may be other things that are, that are um, uh, local priorities that we would seek to, to capture data on. I think the final point in relation to that is um, that the LGBF data, while um, providing a significant suite of data across local government, is not completely comprehensive. And there are other areas where um, we might want to have more forensic uh, attention. So in Fife, um, we would uh, wish to um, develop further intelligent measures in relation to our economic development activity as a priority. Um, and also across early years activity, um, how do we measure success in, 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 in performance in that area? Uh, and that wouldn't be necessarily covered comprehensively in the LGBF data. So that's two examples, there are probably others. Ms Murray. Thank you. Um, I'll maybe not say much more about uniformity than, than uh, Mr Grimmon did, but um, just, just reflect on the, the, the Accounts Commission now in terms of its SPIs. Um, its annual direction now for two years has been that they will use the uh, performance information that they get through the local government benchmarking framework. So that's, I think, been um, extremely positive um, in terms of how councils and the Accounts Commission and Audit Scotland work, work in this, this area. From a council point of view, um, Mr Grimmins, right, I think most councils will probably review, um, I would suspect, on an, an annual basis whether or not the range of indicators that they are using and measures that they are using to assess their performance are still relevant and still appropriate for the way in which services are delivered and the range of services that they, they deliver uh, in the area. Um, for my own council, from my own council's point of view, what we do is we, we have um, a much broader suite of measures than the ones contained within the local, bench, local government benchmarking framework. Um, we have measures that we have identified, but also measures that um, or information that we provide to other um, regulatory bodies um, across Scotland that we look at where we feel that those are very <coughs> important for our public to know about and where we feel that they do accurately um, deal with, with particular aspects of service delivery in our area. So we include those as well and we clearly mark out in our public performance report which are local government benchmarking ones, which are 
um, statutory performance indicators, which are additional measures that the Council uses, which are ones that we maybe send to other bodies, so that there's um, hopefully complete, complete clarity in that. Um, I think, uh, as well as that, though, uh, probably one of the, the important aspects to show that we are reviewing and, and reassessing is that this year in the local government benchmarking framework, you know, just a year in, we, we added another measure this year around economic development to look at our uh, employment activity. And that will be an area that I see as being um, very important to uh, all councils in Scotland and an area that we would want to, to do further work on as well. Um, asked earlier and, and, and at the very outset of this process, um, I, I, I focused on the issue around measurement of inputs versus measurement of outcomes. Um, I get the feeling that we're still a little bit too keen on measuring inputs um, when the, the focus of the sort of the, the, the policy focus, the policy agenda has been more towards delivery of outcomes. So when you're looking at, at the things that you're measuring, where you are measuring an input, are you taking the steps to identify measurable outcomes that you can then, you know, draw draw the draw the narrative between what's going in in terms of funding and what's coming out in terms of performance and quality of service? And I'm aware that data won't always tell you how well the service is performing, but it would give uh, an, an indication beyond simply saying we're putting X amount of money into this service uh, or it's costing X amount per head to educate children. What's the outcome from that? And I know in education we're very good in terms of the attainment data, but other services, I don't think there's maybe that same focus on outcomes rather than just the, the sort of input data that, that gets put before councillors. Ms Murray. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Mr MacDonald. Um, I, th I think the, the input measures and the output measures that we have um, are an important aspect of uh, guiding us into where and how we should be asking questions. Um, can, can I maybe just touch on a piece of national work that I'm doing just now that Mr McAteer referred to earlier on, which is um, work that the Public uh, Service Reform Board is doing around the performance management framework, and I'm uh, leading that particular piece of work for the Public Service Reform Board just now. And what, what we're looking at there is um, the national performance framework, which, as you know, has now been in place for uh, some seven years since the present uh, uh, Scottish Government came into place in 2007. And it is very focused on outcomes. Um, what we are looking at nationally is how we better demonstrate that those outcomes are being achieved um, on an ongoing and progressive basis in a much more effective way than, than we perhaps have managed to um, so far. So I, I agree in part with you that uh, we need to do more work to uh, focus more on outcomes. However, when you look at, going back to the point I was making, that when you look at the in, input and output measures that we use at the moment, um, what those do is though they allow us to start having those very important discussions with colleagues either through the family groups or through peer groups about what outcomes they are achieving with the measures that they've got in front of them and that allows us then to look at how we do what we're doing as opposed to just what the outputs are from what we're doing and that that's that's the link i think between the outcomes and and the measures repeating some of that but maybe to add to it um, and maybe to, to, to use a, a, an example, I think that the benchmark framework indicators are largely inputs and output indicators um, uh, with a, a focus on cost. I think you've got, or certainly how we would approach this in Fife, is to see this alongside um, our council plan priorities, which are largely around outcomes, um, and connect the input and output data to, to those outcomes. Um, so if you took an area, um, for example, looking at social care, then we've got clear outcomes um, identified in relation to providing quality social care to residents in Fife um, against a fairly challenging backdrop, um, not just in Fife but, but nationally. Um, the input and output data um, that is within the local government benchmark framework, again, provides a useful um, set of data that provides an opportunity to challenge um, whether we are doing the right things and whether we are doing those things effectively towards delivering on those outcomes. So that cost data um, 
is asking some fairly hard questions about um, whether we are organising the way that we are delivering social care as effectively as we could to deliver on the outcome. So that that would be the way I would kind of pull together the, 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 the connection there, but clearly that those largely output, input and output indicators can't be used in isolation, nor do we, I think, within, within Fife. Uh, Mr MacDonald, is that you? Yeah. Um, I've got a number of folk who want to come in, so brief questions and brief answers, please. Um, Stuart McMillan, please. So just regarding the, the composition of the, the family groups, um, how, how do you think the, these actually have been working? Are you quite content with them? Um, I, th I think th the family groups, we had, had quite a lot of deliberation before the family groups were, were finalised. So, so, you know, not, nothing that we're doing is, a, um, uh, is, is done in any kind of uh, unconsidered or fully considered, uh, where it's not fully considered. Um, I'm, I'm pr pretty comfortable with the family groups, but the other reason that I'm pretty comfortable with the family groups that Moan Council's a part of is that in addition to that, we have a whole range of peer groups for different measures. So um, I, I don't know if this was in the, the full report that um, the Improvement Service gave you, um, but certainly, I'm just trying to find it here in my notes, certainly within um, some of the, the other bits of work that we do, we have peer groups where they're um, themed. So we would have, there's about half a dozen different peer groups, which allow us then to work with different councils in different aspects, which is not necessarily part of the formal pieces of work that we might do over a course of year, but maybe more um, sort of localised. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of that again this year. Um, a piece of work that uh, North Ayrshire decided to do was to look at non-domestic rate collection. And we decided to do that piece of work with Perth and Kinross, which would not no normally be a family group that we would be related to or a group that would be related to quite different demographics, different um, geographical profile um, and, and so on. So we, but we decided to have a look at them because they were a really, really top performer. And we wanted to find out what they were doing and how they were going about it to see whether there were things that we could do in North Ayrshire to try and improve. And we've got a couple of actions from that that we are going to implement within our non-domestic rates team. And that was staff that did that. Um, so so I, my view is that the, the groups are, are working quite well, but they are not exclusive. You can dip in and out of them to do other pieces of work as you think are particular, particularly relevant to your council. Briefly, I'd, I'd broadly agree with, with Elma's comments in relation to that. Um, I think it's early days in relation to the, the family groups, and I think one of the advantages is the potential for the structured approach through the pilots um, to further examine how effective those family groups can be. So I think it's, it's definitely a positive development and something that we, we are comfortable engaging with, but it isn't the only thing we would engage with. So, for example, when we've been looking at... Um, improvements um, around um, social work provision, uh, again, which is prompted through the local government benchmark framework data. Um, the way that we are taking that forward is with a range of partners, and we've got a particular relationship with North Lanarkshire Council in relation to exploring what, what, what they're doing, because we think that's got a particular relevance to improvements we want to make in Fife. They're, they're, they're not in our, our family group, but we would also uh, engage with that. Supplementary from Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, how could, do you think the family groups could be improved? And you also mentioned peer groups. Are you, you're obviously flicking around with the, with the uh, family groups going to other councils like Perth and Kinross. How could they be improved, do you think? Is there any way? And what is the peer group? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Miss Murray really is. Well, I, 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 found my, I found my note in my peer groups, and I'll include that in the material that I send in to you, because it was part of a, a, a report that we had done internally as well, just to remind everyone what the peer groups were. So we've got peer groups that deal with issues around population, employment, size, young people, child poverty and rurality. So depending on the, the indicators or the service area that we want to look at, then we might dip into doing some particular pieces of work with the local authorities in that particular peer group. Um, so, I guess what I'm saying just now is that I don't, I, I wouldn't have a suggestion for improving the family groups at the moment. I'm quite happy with how the family groups work, as long as my authority and I can dip out 
to look at particular aspects in other areas because there are occasions when I would want the opportunity to go and compare what the council's doing with another council that isn't part of one of the groups that we've currently got. But having all of that information for 32 councils allows you that flexibility and the rigour associated with working as part of a family group. Okay, Cameron. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Vera, just, uh, <coughs> excuse me, just on the back of uh, your comments there regarding the peer groups, um, when you do go to speak to, or when you have staff go to speak to uh, other local authority areas uh, to learn about what they're doing for the best practice, um, and then if you do try to maybe instil some of that in your own local authority area, um, do you do you have a, a consideration to uh, try and include the third sector uh, to potentially actually deliver some of these uh, improvements as well, if there is an opportunity for, th for the third sector to actually get involved? Ms Murray? Yeah. I think my quick answer to that is yes, but I think um, Steve's got a, a specific answer here. Well, just come back, <laughs> Mr <laughs> Grimmond, but uh, if you've got an example, that'd be great. Well, just, yes, is the short answer. An equally short answer uh, would be that, going back to the example I, I used of looking at our social work services and improvement uh, arrangements there, um, looking at the role uh, which the third sector can play in relation to that and learning from experience elsewhere is absolutely central to, to, to that agenda. Okay, thank you. John Wilson, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Ms Murray. Good morning, Mr Grimmond. The issue that I'd like to raise is one of the concerns that we heard uh, in the early days of the benchmarking uh, process was that local authorities were complaining about the number of reporting agencies they had to report different data to. Uh, and I would like to know whether or not the benchmarking process is actually eased up in relation to the amount of reporting that local authorities have to do to other agencies, or have we found a way of being able to provide and collate the information that's required for a range of agencies within that framework? Mr. Grimmins, please. Um, I think that the framework has been a positive step, um, and I think one of the things that local government has to do is, is to get better at um, providing information that will service uh, more than one um, client um, so that we're efficient in terms of how we're, how we're doing that. Um, has that resulted in a reduction in the level of ad other external scrutiny? Uh, I think it's less clear that that's uh, led to a significant reduction. Um, I think the the positive benefits of the local government benchmark framework have largely been for local government in terms of having a more transparent approach to identifying performance and, and driving an improvement agenda, rather than that being a driver to successfully reduce um, a, a wider range of uh, scrutiny. I think all I would, I would agree with the points that Steve's, Steve's made. Um, Mark McAteer earlier on mentioned to you that the local government benchmarking framework information had not just local authorities as its owners, but some other agencies as well. And that's because some of the, the information that we pulled together into the, the, the local government benchmarking framework um, comes as a result of information we perhaps put into um, uh, education um, uh, centrally. Um, and, and Well, that's the, the one that mainly comes to mind just now. So... We are trying to use data for a number of other agencies at the one time, but we have not um, streamlined it, I think, as much as any of us would be um, uh, would wish to streamline it. The, the national work um, that I mentioned to that I referred to earlier on, looking at the performance management framework, um, a part of that, that work that I'm, I'm looking at will be to establish whether or not there are um, performance measures um, in particular, whether there are inputs or output measures which um, don't add real value to what we're doing in terms of public sector and sort of public service in Scotland and whether or not there's scope for some of those to be removed from the suite of indicators that we currently provide to allow us to focus very much on those that are absolutely um, adding value um, to what we do. Um, but that, that's a, a separate piece of work and quite a big piece of work. John. Has there been additional resource implications 
uh, for your local authorities in relation to providing the information that's required for in terms of the LGBF on top of the reporting mechanisms that have already been in place and continue to stay in place at the same time as the LGBF? Ms Murray, please. Um, the, the first year and probably the second year as well, um, I would say that we spent additional time checking and verifying the data. And again, Mark McAteer referred to that earlier on in relation to um, making sure that, the, the, that we were measuring the same things and that the, the quality of the data was absolutely right. I think uh, uh, staff from the different departments that are involved in this now have now got that more um, uh, regularised, if you like, into a, a, a process. Um, so my, my own sense about my own council is that this does not feel um, in, inappropriate in any way or uh, as an additional burden to the council. I would agree with that. I think from, from Fife's perspective, there is no additional burden. I think we're using uh, the staff that would have been engaged in uh, performance data collection more intelligently against that um, balanced basket of indicators. And um, we've reduced some other information that we would have previously been providing because the Council's decided that that's less important. One final question, yeah. convener to Ms Murray. You made reference to the North Ayrshire's membership of APSI and the value that you placed on that membership uh, and you also indicated that there was reporting mechanisms that were in place as a duty of that membership. Uh, do you think that North Ayrshire will continue long term to be a member of APSI or will you think or is there some indication that because of the LGBF that, that some of the indicators that are being used by APSI will be better drawn out in relation to the LGBF rather than being members of, continue to be members of APSI, which has a financial cost to the Council, as I understand it. Ms Murray? Yeah, yes, you're right. We, we do pay to be a part of um, APSI as well. And what, what we do um, uh, as a, a regular process is evaluate on an annual basis um, <coughs> what we want to be part of and what's providing added value to the council. So we wouldn't do it if it wasn't providing us with value. Um, and the value that it gives us is that broader comparison to what's happening um, in England and Wales particularly, but also because of the, the additional elements that we are, uh, elements of service that we're comparing as well, which we, we aren't necessarily comparing through the local government benchmarking framework. As well as APSI, though, we, we participate in a, a range of other benchmarking clubs. Um, so, for example, for IT, we've got the Socketum Benchmarking Club. We um, are part of the Scottish Community Care Benchmarking Network as well. So there are a number of... My, my point in, in picking APSI, because it's a, a big national one that looks outside the, the, uh, the Scottish local authority area, but my, my point in, in illustrating it was not just about that wider lens it gives us, but was also about demonstrating that um, performance improvement um, and using the local government benchmarking framework is, is, not, is not the only way to drive performance improvement. We, we believe in using a range of uh, other benchmarking frameworks and organisations to be part of to help us do that. Just on that point... Ms Murray, are you saying LGBF is not sufficient at the present moment to cover all the areas that your local authority would wish to benchmark? That's correct, because it doesn't, it doesn't have the, the broadest range of indicators that we could use. It gives us um, what we require for statutory performance indicators, and it gives us a lot of very, very good uh, areas of performance. But there are other areas that, as a council, we choose to compare ourselves to because we think that's important to the services that we deliver in North Ayrshire. Okay, Finally, um, you heard my last question to the last panel, I think. Um, all of this was uh, thought to possibly be uh, a set of league tables uh, that would give uh, various folk a stick to beat local authorities with. Um, do you think that that's been the case? And if not, how have we managed to alleviate uh, that, that situation? Ms Murray, do you want to go first, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, thank you, convener. 
Um, <clears throat> I have to say, right at the very start of this process, um, I, I, I was never fearful for the for the council or for myself in taking this forward because I think it is absolutely the right um, the right thing to do at the right time. Um, and I think the the way in which we we uh, started to publish the information um, and I guess our openness in terms of our approach to it, um, I, I think has served the local government community in Scotland particularly well. Um, the, uh, and I, I hope that that will, will continue year on year. Um, so I, I think um, it has been a huge benefit to Scotland already. It has been a huge benefit to a lot of our staff as well as our elected members to take that broader look at um, performance improvement and understand what benchmarking as a process is all about. Okay. Mr Grimmins, please. Yeah, I, I wasn't fearful of that either at the outset, and I think the way it's uh, played out has, has confirmed that lack, lack of fear in relation to the, 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 the framework. I, I think we need to be bullish about being transparent and open about performance, uh, both within local government and with the public that, that, that we serve, and I think the framework provides a means to do that. Um, if we don't know how we're performing, how can we possibly improve? I think it's been a tool that's been helpful in that regard. I think that the other positive thing is it hasn't played out as a single set of league tables. There has been a recognition of local circumstance that Scotland isn't homogenous and we do need to deliver services that are uh, responsive to our local needs and demands. So the way that we've uh, saw that information being played out locally, both through our uh, public performance report and, and any wider examination of that has recognised that those local factors. So I think it's been a, a positive cause for good. Thank you very much for your evidence today. Um, I suspend for 15 minutes uh, for uh, a change of witnesses and comfort break.
Okay. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much. I now welcome uh, our final panel for the day. Uh, can I welcome Councillor Elaine Green, Chair of the Educa Education Committee from East Renfrewshire Council, uh, Mary Shaw, Director of Education, East Renfrewshire Council, uh, Councillor Stephen Curran, Executive Member for Education and Young People at Glasgow City Council, and Maureen McKenna, Executive Director of Education Services at Glasgow Council. Uh, would you like to make any opening remarks at all? Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, no, please, okay. Councillor Green. Just to say thank you very oh, much. Oh, just thank you. Yes, that, that, right, okay. In which case, just we will uh, move uh, straight on to, to the questions. Um, can I ask you overall to what extent the benchmarking framework is used in education services to learn from others and then drive forward improvement? Who wants to start? Councillor Curran, please. Thank you, Kavina. Obviously, it's a great opportunity for us to, to be here today. I mean, it's a really important facet for us and a tool for us in terms of the drive to raise attainment in Glasgow as the largest authority, but also the authority with the biggest issues in terms of disadvantage and also to give every young person the best start in life. So it's been a really helpful tool for us in terms of the recognition, particularly for the Scottish indices of multiple deprivation, um, because you could have a quite simple measure which perhaps doesn't take into account disadvantage and some of the difficult circumstances that young people are facing in different parts of the country. So I think the important thing for us is we can get a clear picture that's measured against our colleagues in other parts of Scotland, and we can also talk about ways of improving and sharing that best practice. And it's been a very helpful um, route for us in terms of getting that information through. But maybe more importantly, it's been helpful for us to show where we have made an improvement and sometimes a very dramatic improvement in terms of raising attainment for some of the young people and facing the most disadvantage. So um, it's used regularly, but it's not used exclusively. Thank you, Councillor Yes, I would agree with what uh, Councillor Kern has said. And we use it extensively across the authority. Although, and we use it with our family group um, of authorities, but also I think we use it across the whole country. Uh, with the elected members find it very uh, valuable because it helps us to scrutinise what we're doing well and maybe what we could improve on. Um, as I say, it's used benchmarking is not the same as Glasgow's, not exclusively, but it's used extensively in East Renfrewshire. Ms. Shaw or Ms. McKenna, do you want to, to add anything? Um, I perhaps would add is that, um, as Councillor Curran said, it's not the only um, set of statistics that we use. Um, I view the, the benchmarking tool as quite a high level and that we would want to certainly, from a, a director's perspective, be able to drill down um, much more down towards individual school and, and uh, classroom level. So, And I know that's the, the same position that I'm sure um, Mary would do, that we do as directors a lot of work um, below those levels of statistics really getting down to look at what makes a difference for every child and young person? Um, obviously, East Renfrewshire has uh, areas of social deprivation as well, and your, your attainment levels are uh, extremely high. Do you drill down to, to look at the differences uh, between uh, socially deprived areas and the attainment levels uh, there in East Renfrewshire, for example, and similar areas of social deprivation in Glasgow and take lessons from that. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Curran. Thanks, I mean, it's probably worth looking at the, the scale in terms of Glasgow is that 42% um, of the children in Glasgow schools are in SIMD 10, that bottom 10% in terms of deprivation stats. So um, sometimes it's difficult to get a comparison that's, that's similar enough. I would say probably we would have um, examples perhaps with uh, colleagues in Fife, for example, where we've looked to share best practice in terms of some of the improvement there because it's similar challenges in terms of the scale of deprivation. But as you made the point, you know, each council can find young people who are facing that disadvantage. Um, I think the, the priority in terms of us is showing that difference can be made for the children who have in the past been deemed to be less likely to succeed. So there's certainly a good conversation we have with colleagues and neighbouring authorities like East Renfrewshire in terms of looking at some of that practice. Um, and also, I suppose, the intensity of that in terms of some of the school environments, we're able to look at what can really make a, a dramatic difference for young people in terms of, of using the benchmarking to show where we could see a, a difference in terms of that level of attainment and raising expectations. And it's not just raising expectations among staff, amongst elected members, it's communities, parents and families um, 
been able to see that that actually is something that can be evidenced on the ground. So they've got to have confidence that it's not just a measure, it's actually showing a progress that they can feel in their own community and in the school that their families are part of. Councillor Green. Yes, um, I would say that we do punch above our weight in our areas of deprivation. We're very, we're very proud of our schools, particularly in the Barryhead area and Eastwood. I think it's all about aspiration for our young people, whether regardless of where they live in East Renfrewshire, we are looking for them to have the best educational experience that they can have, and we are sure that, th that we do that, and the director can and give you more details on how she drills down, and um, it's, I think it's all about quality of teaching as well. Michelle? Thank you, convener. I, I think in terms of the, the, the local government benchmarking framework, the family groupings are, are very helpful, as Councillor Curran has, uh, has referred to. What um, we would say in terms of our youngsters from areas of deprivation is, yes, they perform very well, and that is around uh, or to do with the quality of education that they get in our schools. But we also use the framework to be able to measure ourselves against those councils that are similar in characteristics or profiles. So, for instance, Eastern Bartonshire actually performs better than, than East Renfrewshire in these areas, and we would use that to be able to... Um, work with these colleagues in, in Eastern Bartonshire to find out what it is they're doing that we can learn from. And that's a benefit of both the family groupings and the, the LGBA. So in terms of uh, using the benchmarks um, uh, themselves, um, and let's stick with the, uh, the areas of social deprivation first. Um, do you put uh, more resource uh, into these areas than you do some of the uh, the more well-off uh, areas in, in, in East Renfrewshire. Would that be fair to say? Y yes, we, we, we have had great support from um, the Council in terms of addressing, uh, raising attainment of the lowest performing 20%. And over the last three years, we've had additional support. That, however, has gone across. It's not necessarily focused only on areas of deprivation, but where we have youngsters uh, across the authority, where they they will be in schools that are more affluent, but certainly we have addressed that uh, and, and have targets set for specific groups. Now, those groups may be those uh, who are entitled to free school meals rather than necessarily on an area basis. And it seems from the evidence that you've provided, the written evidence, that East Renfrewshire seems to be pretty forensic in terms of that drill down and then addressing um, any difficulties that it finds. Um, that ethos, has that taken a while to build up or, 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 or is that something quite recent? I, I, I would say we've got a, a pretty mature approach to uh, using benchmarking information and without taking any credit for it myself, my uh, previous boss um, set up a, a unit within the quality improvement team to make sure that data and intelligent use of data was the basis uh, upon which we uh, identify where there is room for improvement but also where there are where there's room for celebration uh, and our schools benefit from all of that right down into sort of individual child level where we we track attainment of individuals from um, primary one all the way through I, I'm interested in the use of, of language that has been used this morning. Uh, Councillor Curran, you said expectation. Uh, Councillor Green, you talked about aspiration. Now we have celebration uh, as well. Um, the, the, I think language is often important in terms of driving forward um, uh, policy and it, it can form attitudes right the way the way from the bottom up and from uh, the, 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 the top down. In terms of uh, reaching those levels of aspiration to get to the celebration point, uh, how, uh, how much input do your frontline staff have? Um, are they aware of these benchmarks? Are they uh, the, the folks that are, are helping you drive forward improvement? Uh, Councillor Curran. Ultimately, they, they are the most important people in, in ensuring that you can celebrate that success. I suppose it's, it has to be taken into account that raising attainment and achieving isn't as simple as some of the measures that are in the benchmarking framework. It's, it's a bigger picture for some, some of the young people. Um, the challenging circumstances when, for example, we've got a fifth of Scotland's looked after and accommodated children. 
that can be a very difficult set of circumstances. We are getting them to achieve as well as the next person in the class is possibly the, the, the target you're aiming for initially with them. And then that level of aspiration has to be developed beyond that. But certainly our staff, we share that bigger picture from the framework. The, the comparator schools and local authorities in terms of the peer group are an important part of that. But sometimes it can be very good informal relationships developed from that. They can become quite formalised around close connections with schools that have got similar issues. For example, from our perspective, it could be a school in the northwest of the city with a neighbouring school in western Bartonshire and they would have similar issues facing the, the communities there and they can share some of the best practice around that. And as long as we can evidence that in terms of it making a, a, a difference and meeting the needs of all the young people, then the staff are the ones that we really trust to do that. The leadership in the schools is very much trusted in terms of taking that forward, involving parents at every point in terms of making decisions and explaining why they're prioritising in a particular manner. But I suppose the key issue for me would be that we have to make it very clear that this is part of the picture and the understanding of every young person and their circumstances is what we expect the staff in the schools and other organisations who they work with to, to be uppermost in their minds to make that radical difference and to celebrate that dramatic change in attainment and other levels of achievement. Councillor Green. Yes, I think as far as aspirations uh, are concerned, everybody from the, the director, the elected members, head teachers, and parents, staff are all aspirational for, for young people and children in East Renfrewshire. Um, benchmarking is very, very important, but I don't think we see it at all as a league table. We do see it as a way that we can challenge where necessary and celebrate where necessary. Um, all of our uh, committee every six weeks, the committee will challenge the directorate if they think it's necessary, but we also celebrate successes of head teachers, of young people. So it's it's across the board. And I think, as the director said, it's since the inception of East Renfrewshire Council in 1996. So it is mature, and I think our elected members know just what questions they should be asking. Thank you. Uh, Mark MacDonald, please. Uh, th thank you, Convener. <coughs> You mentioned um, the, the the drill down beyond the sort of the, the council wide data to, to locally available data. Um, when you do look at the locally available data, is that then made available to both elected members and also communities themselves, for example, parent councils, uh, so that they can see the data that is relevant to to their individual school or, or schools um, with within their communities? I'm seeing lots of nodding, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that as take that as a yes. One of the other things, and one of the traps that I think we fall into uh, far too often, um, and a slight bugbear of mine, is firstly the, the, the distinction between attainment and achievement. Um, and academic attainment is not always the, the encapsulation of the child's uh, experience through the school process. Um, have you looked at, obviously it's very difficult within the sort of data that you're collecting here to capture that wider achievement. So is that something that you've you've looked at as, as councils? Um, and also, one of the other traps that we often fall into is that when we look at attainment levels, we compare the previous year to the current year. And you're talking about two very different groups of children um, who are going through the process. So um, you're, you, the diff difficulty you can always often face is that children are being compared against those who have gone before them, not against their own progress. So what, what steps do you take to, uh, to track the, the child's progress through the school system so that when their attainment is being looked at, it's being looked at not just against what previous years had attained, but also against the expectations that might have been against the attainment for that, that year group itself. Uh, yeah, we, we do look at wider achievement and, and gather that. I, mean, I think it would be fair to say that it's not as mature uh, in the information that we gather, but um, our schools are gathering information about youngsters' involvement as well as achievements that they have in, in activities that would always we would see as um, contributing to their attainment. The attainment would be the measure, um, essentially, 
of, of that achievement. Uh, you're not going to get youngsters achieving well or attaining well if they don't have the confidence to achieve as well. So we do do lots of activities and measures indeed in, in terms of the number of youngsters that go through, for instance, the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Uh, and we um, report that through our standards and quality report, but also through our end and mid-year reports to the Education Committee. I'd, I'd indicated earlier that we do um, track youngsters' individual progress, and that starts in primary one with a baseline assessment, and we have standardised tests that we administer in P3, P5, P7 and S2, uh, and therefore we are able to have those expectations of how youngsters should progress and should attain in the, uh, the later stages uh, at which the LGBF gathers. But certainly that information is used to um, predict what sorts of range of um, attainment uh, results youngsters should be um, achieving or uh, having ambitious for so that our ambitions for that tracking therefore is um, essential and that is available both at uh, individual pupil level but it's also looked at in terms of school or stage performance um, and that is shared with our head teachers but essentially that tracking information is available to all class teachers as well and therefore they can look at what the expectations are for youngsters and amongst lots of other assessment information that they will use for instance through looking at how well they're performing in class. Okay. Ms McKenna. Um, yes, I'll pick up on some of the points um, that, that Mary Shaw was making there. Like Mary, we look a lot at wider achievement. We feel particularly strongly that, particularly for our young people in Glasgow, that we need to um, raise their expectations by broadening their experiences. And we use wider achievement opportunities to broaden those experiences, to develop the confidence and the resilience that, that Mary was referring to, which is so important if young people are going to attain in, in exams. So achievements, and we've been working particularly hard in the last two, three years on Duke of Edinburgh and um, uh, and getting more successes there. Duke of Edinburgh is a very challenging programme um, and so for our young people coming from um, particularly difficult circumstances that can be a real around the planning of it and finding those opportunities and the finance of it can be tricky. We focused a lot on um, sports leadership. We are now the uh, UK's leading um, local authority for sports leadership and that's been a wonderful success for us um, particularly in the run up to the games um, so there's lots of opportunities and, and we report on those again through our standards and quality similar to um, all the other local authorities in Scotland um, I, I do take your point about the, the one year um, attainment statistics being about that particular cohort but for a local authority we need to look at trends over time and whilst you can allow for a little bit of local variation in terms of um, one cohort compared to another cohort actually um, a, across any size of grouping you should be looking at that trend over time to see if you're getting that improvement um, coming through consistently and so you allow for little fluctuations but that needs to be watched carefully our schools track um, individual young people's progress. Um, We're not as um, mature in, in uh, East Renfrewshire terms in terms of the data about individual, and some of that is to do with scale. Uh, you know, the, we, we've got um, 36,000 plus in our primary schools and 26,000 plus in our secondary schools. And we have head teachers who I consider to be senior officers of the authority. And it's their responsibility to track individual young people and central staff go out and, and will sample that and will work and will scrutinise um, some of the data. And we engage in a lot of activities where we bring heads together um, to talk and challenge each other about um, levels of attainment and how we're monitoring and tracking. A gap we have is um, data at primary school, without a shadow of a doubt. It's a national gap um, that's not there. We have looked at um, diagnostic assessment. Um, I have, I'm, I'm, I suppose Can I'm not... Can you explain what you mean by a national gap? 
Well, there is. There's no. Um, there's no national attainment data from three to fifteen. The first national data appears in SQA examinations. Um, there used to be five to fourteen national assessments. Not that I hasten to argue. I'm, I'm uh, arguing for a return to national assessments, but I think there is um, something needed. Um, Standardised tests um, in East Renfrewshire serve a very strong purpose there. There's a whole range of different types of assessments out there. Um, our staff do gather a range of assessment information in primary school and we've worked very closely with them to look at that to ensure that they've got data on each and every young person to make sure that we're raising their expectations and children are making the appropriate progress. But I don't have data that I can gather together to look at how um, Glasgow is performing in comparison with East Renfrewshire at by the end of P4, say, or by the end of P6 or whatever. That data just doesn't exist just now. And I do think it's something that needs to be debated. Can I come back to the point that Ms Shaw made, um, and I'll take you back in a second, Ms Shaw, um, about uh, teachers, classroom teachers having access to this data. You mentioned head teachers and you said that central staff go in and that head teachers, the senior managers, uh, have managed this data. What is the access of your classroom teachers to, to this data? Well, the data comes from classroom teachers. So um, the head teacher um, will have uh, the overall responsibility the senior management team there will link with individual departments and it'll go right down to classroom teachers um, looking at their young people's performance. I was in a previous life a principal teacher of mathematics in a secondary school and the data, we, we used a lot of data and it was in partnership with, with classroom teachers who took the responsibility in their classrooms. And that's the same in the primary school too, where there will be regular meetings um, between the deputy, the head and classroom teachers looking and drilling down on the progress of individual children and that's part and parcel um, of, a, of a primary school or a secondary school nowadays. One of the failings that there always is in this life is when there's no sufficient data transfer and as kids move from year to year and teacher to teacher and possibly even school to school, um, which is often the case, um, how does that data follow on to make sure that we're getting it right for that child? I think in primary schools, um, there's always transition and has, I been. I, mean, I was also in a previous life um, a schools inspector um, and looked at a lot of schools and a lot of the processes they use and transition is a very key part, you're right, you know, the, the transition between a child going from P3 into P4 is a very critical transition for them. Um, a young person equally going from P7 to S1. So over the years, there's been a massive amount of effort going in to that information transferring about the child. What is the most important information that transfers they need to know about the, the child's progress in particular key curricular areas, but also about how that young person is as a learner. And some of the work that's been done through the new curricular reform about personal learning plans is going a long way um, towards improving that level of information that's being transferred and being held within schools. Ms Shaw, you were desperate to come back in, I think. I think w one of the um, one of the things I was remiss in, in, in pointing out earlier was that to overcome that um, year on year um, comparison with different cohorts of children, we have and have continued to have three year target setting. So, uh, and those are targets based on what has been achieved in the previous three years, and then targets are set so that it helps to smooth out. Um, where there might be spikes uh, uh, on an annual basis um, if we go down that sort of annual or three-year um, approach. But going back to what um, Ms McKenna has said, I think Curriculum for Excellence, and certainly we don't have opportunities to be able to um, benchmark at, um, indeed, before S4 now, but 
um, what we are doing is trying to build the skills of teachers in terms of their professional judgments and that is both across sectors and across schools but also I think there's an opportunity to do that between local authorities and some local authorities have started to do that. I'm, I'm not sure that as a country we're able to rely on those assessments yet but of course on top of that you've got the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy uh, on a yearly basis with, with either literacy or numeracy that gives a national picture but Maureen's right to point out that we don't get information from that as an education authority to be able to see how well we're performing against the results on that national basis. Okay, can you say Karen? One point convening as well just to touch on Mr McDonald's question a little bit more is the, the context for this is what happens after the young people leave school. So the positive destinations figures that Skills Development Scotland work on are critical in that because they're broken down to a school level as well as a local authority level and we can compare and contrast and share best practice in terms of some of the challenges that have been faced. The other point I suppose around individual young people is that I think the onus is very much on the secondary level and we do need to see more perhaps national focus on that in terms of primary and even early years as well um, in terms of tackling some of the, the worst disadvantage. But for the young person individually, some of our schools have been doing exceptional work and we're sharing that practice now in terms of lifting the expectations. But more importantly for individuals, you could be on track but you should be on target as well and the target has to be more ambitious than being on track for young people as much as possible. Um, I've seen very good examples in some of our secondary schools where individual pupils in one subject it gets drilled down to that level and we've looked on this from an elected member perspective as well as the, the professional focus in terms of saying what works in that environment getting that young person to achieve better even in one subject compared to other ones and that individual approach that the staff lead on and collate is critical in that process. Just to come back to uh, Mr McDonald's question about achievement. Um, achievement is celebrated in East Renfrewshire in, in a big way. We have conveners awards for outstanding achievement for young people. It's not all about educational attainment. It's about the rounded child and the learning experience. Um, and very often they will be invited along to committee and their achievements celebrated there with the elected members as well. No. No. Okay, thank you. Alec Crowley, please. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Still, Still is just, <laughs> just. Could I just maybe come at this a, a, a bit different? And I mean, I'm just looking here at the the um, accounts commission, and, and they state that council spending on education fell by five percent in real terms between 2010-11 and 2012-13. So you are operating in, in a fairly difficult um, financial environment right now, and. I know the signs are that that um, it's not certainly going to get any easier. How does this information and what other information should be brought together to influence policy makers um, in terms of, if you take this place, um, the direction of funding and, 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 and how funds should be used, what should be directed at, in terms of councillors and local authorities, what they should be prioritising? How do we actually you just type of information and it's, it's difficult for me, I think, to look at that and, and I, I do commend both authorities that are here today for the progress that you are making and I know Glasgow more so um, than, 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 than I do um, East Renfrewshire, but in Glasgow's case, the levels of deprivation and poverty and the progress that has been made is, 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 is great. Um, but we, right across Scotland in education, I think we need to do much better. What is it we need to do and how can we use this? For example, I came from, from, from a council, Fife Council, um, and, and, and on the advice that we were getting, um, it shifted significant amounts of money into early years because the advice we were getting was that by the time a child is five, four or five coming into primary school, um, actually their future could be set out for them. And, and you've got to get in there much earlier. But how do we prioritise and how do we use all this information to, to make the case for where we should be directing resources? First. Um, well, I think it has to be targeted to, to where it's needed most. Benchmarking certainly helps where you see that there, there is room for improvement and we can um, put extra resources in there. But in East Renfrewshire, we're uh, investing a substantial amount of money in early years in the Auchenbach area because it is seen as an area of deprivation 
you're, you're rightly saying we're working with the CHCP partners and Sir Harry Burns in getting in as early as possible, not looking to intervention, but looking to prevention. So we're targeting a lot of our resources there. But just across the board, spend the money where it's needed. It's very difficult in this um, in the climate just now. We're all having to, to pull in our horns, and it's it's not easy. But it must. The money always must go to where, where the most need is, in my opinion. Councillor Curran, Thank you. I suppose a good example of that would be the focus on early years that. Yeah, Mr Rowley mentioned um, ourselves in East Renfrewshire were the only two councils that were delivering 575 hours uh, for free nursery place. Um, are we ahead of other local authorities in Scotland because both our local authorities prioritised that? And it was obviously a, a Scottish Government objective and it was a wish that other people had, but the resourcing wasn't necessarily there. But both these authorities made a conscious effort to prioritise that. And you can see that in terms of the, the measures of the improvement service outline, in terms of the expenditure on... Um, each nursery place. Now that's largely around having better qualified staff. Sometimes in our situation it's having standalone establishments in particular areas of deprivation where we know that that's what's needed in that area for pre-5 education to be delivered in a quality environment for young people facing the most difficult circumstances. So for, for our perspective, certainly with the pressure on finance, we've got a political commitment around that. We know there's a national goodwill around focusing on early years at the moment. But to some extent, we're ahead of the curve because we always saw it as an important place to put our money where our mouth was. And I think that from a national perspective and also working with other colleagues across the country and councils, the improvement service benchmark and support that you can see today before your committees is an important aspect in saying, well, what do we do? How do we do it? How do we adapt to that pressure and resource? And bluntly, how can you make savings to continue to deliver that service when there's growing expectations around um, two-year-olds, which we've already been meeting for the first year of expectation around vulnerable two-year-olds. But that growing pressure is something that we'll need to find extra resource from. And as Mr Rowley said, the resources are not going to be uh, rising overall over the next few years. We expect it to be a more difficult situation for us. So that's an important aspect of it, that the political commitment followed up by the evidence that shows that you're actually putting your money where your mouth should be. Um, there is the case of putting your money where your mouth should be uh, in some regards, but also in terms of early intervention, the um, Glasgow City Council gave evidence to the Finance Committee not so long ago, um, and the Finance Committee said the statements from Glasgow City, City Council about the lack of, of, of existing evidence raise serious questions about why such key delivery agents are not familiar with the available wealth of information on early intervention that is discuss discussed throughout this report. Have there been improvements in terms of the evidence gathering um, that Glasgow is, is now doing in, in that regard? Ms McKenna. Um, it's a, a report that the uh, Finance Committee had um, not so long ago, um, and that was one of the conclusions in the Finance Committee's um, uh, report. Well, can't comment on it well, if I've not well, read it. We, we, we can allow you to come back and comment on that later. So it's, it's worth commenting on it briefly. And I suppose it depends what the early intervention point was, was on. If it was on early years specifically, there's obviously the early years collaborative, which is a new way of all the local authorities, the NHS and other partners, including the third sector, working on um, the early years focus in terms of early intervention. In terms of some of the work that's been going on there, that is quite new in terms of measuring the, the process and measuring the, the outcomes in terms of that. So it could be that it's because of the, the infancy, if you like, in terms of the early years collaborative and some of the work around that, that we all need to get to grips with, with the, how that really makes a dramatic difference. It was um, uh, an in inquiry uh, into preventative spend, and it was uh, 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 in 2011. Um, and it was basically about your early intervention programme. And I believe that um, Ms McKenna may have been a witness. Um, but if uh, we, we can we can come back to that because that that is a trickier question. But I think it's important that we we manage to evidence these things. Sorry, Mr. Riley. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm puzzled as to where you, you, you pulled that out for the convener. Uh, well, but I, I think it's just anyway, in terms of the early intervention <laughs> aspects and actually gathering up the evidence to yeah. ensure um, that the resource that's going in is actually getting the outcome that we actually require and that we are actually evidencing that as well, yeah. Mr. Riley. But back to that point about how we influence policy, I mean, there needs to be, I certainly favour a, a debate in Scotland around, around education and where we go. 
um, and and the importance or not of of early intervention and, and the evidence for that. I'm interested from an educationalist point of view how, how perhaps the director also <coughs> see that in terms of how we use evidence. What have we got there? What else do we need? Um, some people say that, for example, if you're going to put a major investment into early years, it will be 10, 15 years before you'll be able to actually prove that that worked. Others say that's not the case. You should be able to so I'd be interested in that point of view. Um, and my final question as well would be, again, in that area, looking at how we go forward in terms of education, training and skills. Um, in terms of employment, it just seems to me that education, training and skills are absolutely key. Um, but the links with vocational versus academic, the, the links with colleges, um, at, at what early stage, and I'll just briefly try and say that by, if you take in my own constituency, we have, we have the, the aircraft carriers being, being um, pulled together. They've also parts them have been built in Glasgow. Um, what I'm finding with those employers there is that they're recruiting all over Europe because they can't recruit the skilled labour in the local area. And it's, it's again, how do we measure what the links are with, with businesses? How, how much is education actually working with business to ensure that kids are able to get the qualifications that actually allow them to then develop the skills and get the skills? Mm -hmm. So how do we use all this information, I suppose, to try and, as a policy maker, um, looking at this, how to, to be able to direct future priority and future spend? Shall we go to the um, educational professionals first and then the politicians? Ms Shaw? Well, I'll come back to the um, school leaver destinations and, and, and the links to employers. And, and I do think that that is an area that certainly we can strengthen in East Renfrewshire. But in terms of the early intervention and being able to measure the impact of that, I think Councillor Curran is right to point out the work of the Early Years Collaborative. The fact that youngsters um, and their um, progress with developmental milestones uh, is going to be measured at the 27 to 30 month assessment and again at, at, in the entry to primary school and again indeed in primary four are opportunities to gather evidence to show the impact of that early intervention. The early intervention though is more about working with families and, in, and this is something that I know that in Glasgow they're working very hard on as we are in East Renfrewshire to make sure that we make that difference at as early a stage as we can. So with youngsters before they reach nursery age, before they become three and identifying and working with our colleagues in um, East Renfrewshire's H CHCP to make sure that, that we identify them. Uh, there is a, a way to go to make sure that, that those um, measures that we will gather are robust. Uh, I'm not sure that we have a, a, co a, a coherent um, set of assessments that is um, consistent across the country and, and certainly even within East Renfrewshire it's not consistent but um, I think we will be able to see results from that. Uh, we gathered a baseline last year in line with the national um, target uh, and we'll see I'm sure some impact of that this year because of the family friendly approaches that we've been taking in our pre-5 centres. Thank you. Ms McKenna, please. Okay, thank you. I'm busy racking my brains on the 2011. I've been to the Parliament a few times. Um, I think that it is. it was three years ago and, and we have moved forward. Um, I think, though, as, as Ms Shaw says, the evidence to support preventative spend, um, as, as Mr Rowley was saying, is long term and there still is a lack um, I don't think Glasgow is any different from anywhere else about that coherent set of indicators that would um, allow you to be able to say, am I making a difference? Um, our work is um, very much focused with third sector and families and nurseries and we work very closely with our um, health colleagues and it is across the boundaries. Um, so there's shared learning because it's NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, so I know that, that East Renfrewshire are also working along the same lines in terms of um, looking at family centres and the support that we provide there. It's been very much um, focused, in my view, in Glasgow because of the scale of the challenge that we face is that we work very much with third sector. 
and looking to see where we can maximise um, the support from the third sector, who I believe are much better placed than the statutory services to make an impact in local communities, because it is more than just what happens in a nursery. It's beyond the doors of the nursery. The nursery can be a catalyst um, and can pull partners together. But actually, if we are going to impact systemic long term change, we need to look at how our communities function and how they are uh, working as families and how we can support those families. Um, and whilst there's no kind of coherent agreement, we have been undertaking in the last three years a significant amount of research in partnership with the Centre for Population Health, um, looking at longitudinal evidence of what differences our interventions um, are making. And one of the things that we started um, as long ago as 2011 was also um, stretching the age range from the early years collaborative, which when it started was very focused at under fives, we always said from the outset in Glasgow that we needed to keep it as zero to eight because our children um, do continue to experience difficulties. Families um, take time to build their capacity. And in terms of um, policy making, I suppose one of the, the challenges we faced in the city um, with our college partners is being able to um, build the resilience of families, build their confidence, help them with their literacy levels, signpost them on to um, employment, further training, but being unable to get them to access college places because the funding became focused on 18 to 24 and some of our vulnerable parents were um, 25 plus and that's been particularly challenging and it's um, I sit on the board for Glasgow region and it's an area that we are looking at there to see how we can assist with that. Um, I don't know if you want me to go on to the business partnerships that Mr Rowley mentioned. Um, Vocational education, clearly a critical area for us, and we have been making um, a slow, steady progress in terms of our positive destinations. Um, it's been hard-fought gains, and um, we're t making little steps every year um, to improve and to close the gap on the national picture. And we've been particularly focusing on raising expectations and aspirations. And so our biggest gains have been around higher education delivered in both um, uh, colleges and in universities. And up at, at uh, this year, well, 2013, we increased by 2.5% when nationally it dropped by 0 0.6, which in, in Glasgow terms is, is uh, well, I was particularly proud of that one. Um, but we recognise that our business partnerships are absolutely critical. I think as, as an education service, we've spent a lot of time um, getting young people ready for businesses, looking at employability skills and lots of programmes. I think what we've not done well is get businesses ready for young people. Um, so businesses, particularly small and medium enterprises, who are the biggest range in Scotland of working with them, because it is a big, big decision for a small business to take on a young person and for them to understand um, and to be able to respond to that young person's needs. So that's this year's um, challenge for us, is working in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce in the city, is to look at how we can work better with our um, a small and medium-sized businesses, but also look at the senior phase programmes to see whether we can build better pathways and um, perhaps not using traditional um, a attainment measures such as hires, but looking at national certificate pathways, higher national certificate pathways that would be delivered between schools, colleges and businesses so that young people start to get business experience from a younger age, perhaps maybe a day a week and, and moving forward. I'm aware that we're now straying into uh, various realms of education policy, and I don't want to upset the Education Committee in that regard. Well, so in terms of um, uh, uh, the benchmarking aspects, if we could try and stick to, to that aspect in the main, and uh, if we could temper the questions to that. And uh, Councillor Curran. Yeah, I think the important point, Convener, is that the benchmarking would have to sit alongside the Wood Commission in terms of developing Scotland's young workforce. And, Obviously, the points that Mr Rowley made in terms of that are, are where we very much have to sit because 
the work that uh, Mrs McKenna's out in terms of business partnerships, but also the relationship with the college sector is important. And the, I suppose the critical issue for me is that we sent up to a single outcome agreement as a council. The benchmarking is based on a council perspective with partners. The colleges and the universities are, are in a slightly different environment and a different committee, indeed, in terms of the remit. So um, it's an important way for us to look at it as, in terms of answering the specific points around how do we make the young people ready for, for the, the job market that's out there, but also how do we measure it against our colleagues in other parts of the country. Thank you, Councillor Curran, for, for that. I'm impressed that you got back there and did it very, very well indeed. Councillor Green. Most of the points have already been um, covered, but as far as vocational education is concerned, we certainly welcomed what the, the Wood Commission recommend, recommendations were, and we certainly need to link more with business. As far as early years and early intervention is concerned, Ms McKenna covered it uh, very well. We need to get to the communities, work with families, and ask what they need of us and not impose what we think they need. Um, so it's all about communication. Thank you. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you. I just want to focus on this, sorry, on this positive destination. What do you mean by positive destinations? I mean, this is surely it depends on where you are. Like um, Mr Rowley mentioned, you know, in Fife they have, they're looking for engineers and shipbuilders. I mean, you focused a lot on positive de uh, destinations, particularly Ms McKenna and the rates from Glasgow schools. What exactly do you mean by positive destinations? Directing the pupils into... Are you directing them? Are you giving them education, vocational guidance? Or, and how do you monitor it? Can, can we temper that slightly and say, how do we benchmark? Yeah, monitor uh, Yes, all right. Death, benchmark, death that's what I really meant. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. Sorry. Uh, Michelle, do you want to... Yeah, uh, po positive destinations are youngsters who are going on to schools to higher or further education, employment, or, or indeed training. And, uh, and those are the measurements that are shared... Uh, in terms of the work of Skills Development Scotland, and, and that is uh, published on an annual basis, um, uh, and that information is shared again through the, cam the family groups. We've um, identified, we've been working in the pilot on um, from the LGBF with uh, positive destinations or, or the school leaver destination return. In my own view, I have to say I think that is the fairest measure of a school. Um, the, regardless of where it comes from, you can get lots of schools in, in Glasgow, for instance, out uh, performing many schools in East Renfrewshire in terms of youngsters going on to positive destinations. They won't be going on to the same destinations. We um, undoubtedly have a, a large cohort of our youngsters who go into higher education. But as long as youngsters are going to the correct destination and that uh, destination is sustained uh, and the measure that, that is followed up in March is often a better measure of how successful we've been in getting those youngsters into the, or onto the right pathway. But sharing information um, through that family group that we're already working with uh, um, and really sharing best practice um, and looking behind the actual statistics that are uh, published is, is the way forward in making sure that we seek and, and indeed secure improvement. Uh, Councillor Curran. I suppose an important uh, set of examples for your convener would be the number of pupils who gain level five or level six qualifications. You look at East Remshire statistics, for example, and they would appear to be streets ahead. And, and rightly so in terms of the, the focus on that. In terms of the, the work that we're doing, we want to see ourselves uh, measurably improving in terms of the work that's been done against um, other comparisons. But that specific figure is vitally important for us to show that we have lifted the expectation. So those are two important benchmarks. But the positive destination, I want to go back to Mr Buchanan's point, we need to see more of our young people seeing higher education, further education, as where they would expect to be. And that's something that we're very much focused on. And as long as we can see that um, particular improvement over the past year where we had a growth in terms of young people going into higher education when there was a slight dip in terms of the Scottish figure, that's a warm uh, feeling across Glasgow in terms of all the schools seeing that they have made a dramatic difference there. OK, thank you. Cameron? Thank you. Well, I'm just going to, sorry, I'm just going to ask. Um, do you monitor after they've left school? Do you actually monitor, do you benchmark, to use the word, after they've left school? Or is it just when they leave school? It's, it's actually Skills Development Scotland contact them a year after to ensure that the destination remains the same, roughly. Um, but we can certainly look at more work on that, and I think that's why it's important that the, the bigger picture through the whole process of education is vital in terms of the benchmarking um, being part of that picture. Yeah. 
John Wilson, please. Thank you, Thank you Good afternoon. I'm uh, just trying to drill down into the benchmarking framework, particularly for Glasgow, and there may be issues in terms of East Renfrewshire. But I know that in the area that I live in, in part of the constituency I represent, there are approximately 450 secondary school pupils are bussed in from the East End of Glasgow every day into Coat Bridge to a high school there. How do those the attainment levels, achievement levels and positive destinations get measured in relation to the benchmarking framework because they are not being educated by Glasgow City Council, they are edu being educated by North Lanarkshire Council. So how do those figures and those pupils get measured in relation to particularly Glasgow City Council's benchmark figures because they're not being educated in Glasgow. The cross-boundary issues. Ms McKenna. They're part of North Lanarkshire Council's secondary school system. Um, the, the young people who um, uh, travel into the schools in Coat Bridge are attending there by right because their primary schools are associated with that secondary school in the same way that in Western Bartonshire there's a primary school that sits in Glasgow that historically um, is associated. We had the same situation until recently um, that East Renfrewshire had to change because of the pressures um, on, on the building that they had with their, their uh, house building growth. Um, down at the at the southwest of the city. So although the, the children are educated at primary level in Glasgow, um, the responsibility is part of North Lanarkshire for the secondary, but we work closely with North Lanarkshire and we wouldn't consider removing them or seeing them as, as Glasgow City Council children. I think Ms McKenna has picked me up wrongly in terms yeah. of what I'm trying to get in terms of drilling down into the benchmarking framework, mm -hmm. is to find out how those children, what benchmark framework do they get measured in? Mm -hmm. Do they get measured in North Lanarkshire's benchmark framework? But bear with me, Ms McKenna, because some of those children are com coming from the most deprived areas in Glasgow, and therefore some of the figures that are being produced for Glasgow in terms of the framework may be being skewed because you're not accurately measuring residents of Glasgow and children that live in Glasgow who are being educated in a neighbouring authority. And it's just trying to find out how we, is there any way we can address that issue to ensure that the adequate resources and adequate measuring, because what you've said in terms of the attainment, achievement and positive destination there's four, potentially 450 children who live in Glasgow and those measurements are being placed against or set aside another authority rather than being set aside Glasgow City Council. And it's whether or not the, we are adequately measuring that in a way that takes full account of the potential long-term problems. I'm not talking about just an education I'm talking about beyond education years for Glasgow City if the, in terms of the measurements that are coming out of the benchmarking framework. Ms McKenna? I suppose it's, it's a chat. I mean, some Glasgow children use place, some parents use placing requests to go into different authorities all over. And I suppose the challenge would be as to how you unpick that then, because a number of our children are mobile aren't they? You know, families choose to go to different schools. Um, and, and that is a challenge. Um, I'm not sure. I have, I have to confess, I haven't thought about it in those terms. And I'm not sure um, how you would unpick or unpack those statistics. I mean, we have to work in partnership to have the assurance that um, the young people are getting the best possible opportunity and certainly our psychological services work closely with North Lanarkshire for any young person transferring. But I'm, I'm, I am, I have to say, I'm struggling in terms of how to think about that in terms of the benchmarking I, tool. I notice that others want to come in. I, I think in, in some regards, you know, from a tracking point of view where you have 
uh, kids mm-hmm. who have gone to primary school in one local authority area and then suddenly go uh, into another local authority area. Um, that skews the the yearly tracking in some in, in some regards. I'm sure if if they're uh, if kids are coming from uh, uh, more deprived areas with traditionally lower levels of attainment. It may well skew in some areas the other way um, and show that f- folks are doing better in secondary uh, because it may well be kids from affluent areas going to poorer secondaries. Uh, Ms Shaw? I, I think, um, thank you, convener, that um, the, the LGBF is, sits out of kilter. Uh, I think it would be fair to say in this aspect because um, we would always use information to help our schools improve uh, as they would in Glasgow. And it's more difficult to do this or to indeed use that as a measure of an authority um, that is educating a child or is not educating a child. Uh, and I think that's what, what Maureen is, um, is suggesting. So um, I think there is opportunity for the LGBF to be brought into line with the other measures that we have in terms of the um, attainment um, of youngsters who attend schools as opposed to where they reside. I think we would always say that we take responsibility for any children that are in our school, regardless of where they stay, they are East Renfrewshire pupils, uh, and we uh, teach them and, and hope that they learn and achieve in the same way as we would for any of our other children who live within East Renfrewshire. Thank you. Councillor Curran, you were wanting to come in. It's a very important question Mr Wilson's raised. I suppose there are two aspects to it. One is the, the catchment area where you, you already can plan for the young people uh, the anticipation that they go to that school. Now, of course, they can still have parental choice around uh, denominational, non-denominational. They can have parental choice around placing requests out with the area of their catchment area. I think every year in Glasgow we have around 3,000 applications for placing requests into primary one and, and S1. Um, and that's almost entirely within Glasgow in terms of that number. But it means that it's, it can sometimes be quite difficult to plan. So you need to know the young people very well. And that's where the benchmark is important at a high level, but drawing it down is really significant. The other important point from a Glasgow perspective, and it's the same in, in other cities, particularly across Scotland, is the number of young people who are coming to the city for the first time from out with Scotland. Um, we've actually got um, about 15 to 20 per cent of young people have, have English as an additional language, but 15 per cent from a black and minority ethnic background. Every year in Glasgow now, we're seeing 2,000 new pupils presenting at school with a range of language needs. So how do you measure that in terms of the, the, the benchmarking and have a fair assessment in terms of the needs that they have to have met in the school? It's easy to do that, but understanding a, a, a wider picture is very significant. But I think it's, it's a really important question about understanding who who is your community that you are serving. And in a Scottish context, it's easier. But you're right, we need to have a better um, clearer picture in terms of explaining who's where and how does that impact on the delivery of that service. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And McTaggart, please. Thanks. Good afternoon, panel. And uh, aiming at Glasgow for this one, and in your paper that you did submit, you have highlighted a very interesting point, and I'll, and I'll para- paraphrase, that it is important that Glasgow continues to actively benchmark against other suitable authorities within the wider national and UK context. Now, some of the panel members that have been in this morning that I have asked them about their UK connections, can I ask what Glasgow is? Uh, Ms McKenna? Yeah. Um, we look at um, Manchester and we're also looking at London too um, because of the scale and the numbers. You know, as, as Councillor Curran said, um, 42% of our children live in the 10% most deprived postcodes, which is um, about 27,000 children and young people. Um, and there isn't another authority that's kind of close to that in terms of percentage and scale. So it's important that we keep that outward look. Um, and then particularly, um, we linked with Manchester for a bit of work, um, particularly around the games and, and looking at synergies between the two councils. Um, more recently, um, I've been looking very closely at some of the London Challenge work and the impact that um, that that initiative had in terms of raising young people's attainment, in particular their aspirations, given the level of um, deprivation that was associated there. Councillor Curran, do you want to come in? I think the important 
point, Kavina, is it's not a two-way process. That, for example, yesterday we had a head teacher from a London school up to look at the dramatic improvements we've seen in terms of improving attendance at school and reducing the, the, the level of exclusion. Um, because that's fundamentally the most important thing to do if you want to raise attainment to make sure the young person is at school and, and able to, to continue at school. Um, so we've certainly got a very good understanding and a close partnership, particularly in terms of London and Manchester, um, because of the, the, the challenge work that was uh, conducted by the UK government in earlier years. Now that's similar to our raising attainment agenda that we share with the Scottish government and other colleagues across Scotland. There was a lot of resource went into that, and we know that resource isn't there, and that's an important aspect in terms of, of measuring that relationship we have with colleagues elsewhere in the islands. Do you look at uh, any other European or, or world cities which yeah. are comparable to Glasgow? Yeah, I mean, very much so. Obviously, the, the PISA um, results come out uh, on, a, on a basis that's, that's measured nationally, but we obviously look at what does that mean for us in terms of the context in Glasgow. Um, obviously, the Commonwealth Games have been a fantastic opportunity for us to have international education as a big focus in our schools. Um, around the Commonwealth Family of Nations, partnership with UNICEF around children's rights. So we've got some very good developing work that's going on. Um, we're certainly looking at work that's going on, for example, in the Canadian cities, where they have a different approach to early years and perhaps there's more focus on um, four-year-old full-time places rather than two-year-old and three-year-old places. Um, so we're, we're developing a lot of relationships um, certainly out with the, the Scottish picture, but the benchmarking is our bread and butter because that's how we'll be measured and assessed in our communities. Thank you very much. Anne, please. Just answered. Um, the next question was um, budget settlement, um, how that's impacted in the budget settlement, but you've just answered and gave a, a fine example of that. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, you heard me ask the others, I'm sure, um, uh, about the, the fact that uh, everybody thought that there would be pelters when this uh, framework uh, came into play. Uh, uh, well, some folk were actually talking about the, the possible press headlines. Um, that hasn't happened. Uh, do you think that that's because uh, your authorities are, are managing this particularly well and giving explanations um, for the differences that exist. Yeah? Ms. Ms. We'll McKenna. The and work our way around. That's what we'll do. Um, uh, yeah, I, I do think, I think that um, uh, a, a number of journalists, whilst they like the headlines, actually um, recognise that benchmarking is very important and that uh, the context um, of a local authority is particularly critical and that, that we take the approach that statistics and benchmarking don't provide answers but really all they do is raise questions that allows as many people as possible to engage and that actually it's that dialogue that brings about the improvements, not the benchmarking in itself. Thank you. Councillor Curran. I think an important aspect for, for a Glasgow perspective in terms of benchmarking is there is a recognition in terms of deprivation as a significant factor in terms of determining the outcomes for all the young people. Certainly from my own perspective, I feel that if you have a political leadership and direction that sees this as important, if you've got professional commitment, particularly from the staff in our schools, and you've got an openness and confidence around being able to explain why you are in a particular place, but also to explain why you're not perhaps what people would anticipate it to be for good or bad reason, then that sharing of the information is obviously good in terms of being accountable to all the people who we represent. Thank you. Councillor Green, please. I think because we have really been doing this from the inception, as I said earlier, in East Renfrewshire Council, it's something that we're comfortable with, we're comfortable with comparison. It's something I think that elected members really appreciate and parents, parents can see the, the, the information's out there, they can see exactly where we're going in the authority and if they don't like it, they would certainly let us know. And it's so easier to do it when you're right at the top of the tree in so many aspects. Uh, Ms Shaw. I don't think I've got anything <laughs> further to add from what my convener has said. Well, thank you very much for your evidence today. I suspend for just a, a brief moment uh, to uh, allow the witnesses to leave. Thank you.
We can now move on to agenda item three, uh, which is to consider uh, the petition PE1469 by Aileen Jackson, which calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to consider a change in planning regulations to enable an increase in the current neighbour notification distance of 20 metres in relation to wind turbine planning applications. Uh, as members will recall, we have taken evidence on this petition as part of our scrutiny of the third national planning framework. We have a paper before us today which sets out the actions we have taken on this petition since it was referred to us in December last year. During our evidence taking on the petition, the Scottish Government indicated that it did not think it necessary to change the current neighbour notification distance, but Minister Mackay informed us that the Government would look as issuing new best practice guidance on the notification system uh, of wind farm applications. We have now received correspondence from the Scottish Government confirming this and setting out a timetable for the development, consultation and publication of such guidance. This is attached to the paper we have before us. Uh, can I ask members to, to look at the paper and see if you have any comments on the issue or the petition? No. In which case, can we agree to write to the Scottish Government acknowledging the actions taken on PE1469 and drawing up the aforementioned guidance? Uh, can we request that the Government ensures that the petitioner specifically consulted on the proposed draft guidance and that any views she expresses are taken into account by the Government before it finalises such guidance? Can we ask that a copy of the finalised guidance be provided directly to the petitioner uh, and that we be notified of this by the Government when the guidance is published in spring 2015? And can we request that the Government ensures that the finalised guidance is properly publicised and brought to the attention of all planning authorities in Scotland, as well as all of those making applications for the development of onshore wind farms and any other relevant persons or organisations whom the Scottish Government considers it appropriate to notify. Thank you. Uh, in light of the Government's decision to issue guidance on neighbour notification as a result of PE 1469, there would be, be, appear to be no further reasonable action we can take in relation to this petition. Therefore, we are, agree, uh, are we agreed to close petition PE 1469 with immediate effect and ask the clerks to write to the petitioner and the Public Petitions Committee to notify them of this decision? Thank you. Uh, before we finish, I'd like to take this moment to thank the petitioner, Ms Aileen Jackson, on the record for her petition. I feel that this is an excellent example of where an individual using the Parliament's petition system can affect meaningful change in important areas of public policy, such as the planning system. I'd also like, like to thank the Public Petitions Committee for the work they undertook in this petition before it was referred to us. Um, as agreed, can we now move into private session? I suspend.